Welcome back. Well, Chess.com and the Charlotte Chess Center are proud to announce the Blitzcoin Invitational. In this new action-packed event, the best U.S. chess players, 25 and under, will compete for their share of one Bitcoin, currently valued at more than $36,000. Mark your calendars for October 27th through 31st. Uh, Alexander, I was very excited to read this off because, uh, well, the Charlotte Chess Center, near and dear to my heart, this was an idea that was originally hatched uh, as a collaboration between a very close friend of mine, uh, Akila, who's a mod on my channel, uh, as well as uh, Peter Giannatos, the my close friend and the founder and director of the Charlotte Chess Center. I will be participating. I was going. I don't know who, the, who is this on the cover. I asked Chess. Yeah, why does he look? Why does this person look so ominous? He's kind of intimidating. Uh, he makes me I just want to resign. I know. It's it, uh, why would such an individual be invited to such a good tournament, Alexander? Can you explain the Charlotte Chess Center? Why would it ever host anything? I, man. Yeah, I don't um, know. If I saw this guy, <laughs> I would walk the opposite direction. So. Same here. Same here. Well, uh, I hope he doesn't do any commentary for chess.com. That, that would, would be, be awful. That would be awful. But uh, on a serious note, yeah, uh, I, I, I know both those two people as well, Aquila and Peter. They're both very talented individuals. And it's cool that they're throwing this and that weird person on the cover is going to be playing. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be super exciting. Uh, we're going to have really all of the top uh, American young players. I hesitate to call myself young in chess terms. I'll be one of the oldest. I'll be a, you know, I'll be a, a <laughs> 25 and under, and I'm the top age. That's uh, slightly depressing, but nonetheless, I'm going to try to maintain. But you're going to be the old old guy's honor. I, I think. Well, I'm 25, and this tournament is going to be held a week before my 26th birthday. So I just slide in by the narrowest of margins. Oh, that's amazing. I'm actually also 25, turning 26 in September. Danya, we're getting cool. old. <laughs> we are, we are. It's time, tempus, fujit. We're, we're, we are getting old, but uh, the chess world's getting younger, and, and this tournament is going to be so much fun. So yeah. it's going to be late October, end of October. Mark your calendars. Um, I'm so honored and excited to be playing and grateful to chess.com to chess for uh, helping so much with the organization and promotion. Uh, couldn't have happened, of course, without all of the people involved. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of chess, what are the games starting here? I know that we're following them. I don't think any of them have started yet, right? No, I believe the games have not started, but they are going to begin any second now. And uh, we will, of course, have eight matchups to begin because we've got 16 players. We remind you that uh, each matchup com is con uh, consists of two games, and then there's a uh, winner's bracket and a loser's bracket. So everybody gets a chance to play tomorrow. We're probably going to start by sort of uh, reviewing all of the games and uh, recapping the participants. But I'm, I'm super excited. I'm excited to see Daryl Morey play. Um, I've heard of a lot of these guys, and I really want to see uh, how many of them are well prepared. Uh, we're going to talk also a little bit about the pre tournament I've favorites, but I assume the ratings are going to make that determination. Yeah, absolutely. And the funny thing is, I, I talked to one of my friends who was going to play. Uh, she ended up not playing, but it was cool to get her perspective about how it's really fun to play other people in the industry. And you're always trying to trying to do your best, even if it's, you know, a game that you don't have that much time for. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of how a lot of people play chess in the workplace, like one of those nice after work activities. Indeed. Yeah. I remember when I visited my close friend on Facebook as the games have begun, uh, you know, it's all friendly camaraderie during work hours, hours, Alexander, but the moment they sit down at the chessboard at 5 2 PM, Oh boy, there are some egos on the line, let me tell you. And the games have begun. We see one C4 played uh, in the game between Surajit Chatterjee and the stock guy. I taught the stock guy yesterday. At some point, his rating hit 100, um, and he spent half of the lesson just roasting me. So honestly, I would be mildly entertained if he ends up getting checkmated in four, but I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think the lesson actually Ooh. paid off and he'll be fine. So toxic, Alexander. Just, uh, that, that, just that's just incredible. a ball of toxicity. How could you? <laughs> I don't, no, it's okay. We were, we were roasting back and forth. I think I think it's fair. And he's actually <laughs> off to a, a pretty good start here. Are we listening in on what he's saying? Some people may be trying to focus. So generally, let's. Okay. Cool. I have no yeah, idea what's going on. Because I'm waiting for him to make his first move for a minute over here. Kane, are you there? All right, guys. Yeah. Here we go. I'm trying my best here. These people are talking in the background. I don't know how to mute them. I don't know if I'm supposed to mute them or not. <laughs> okay, 
Okay. Wait, is it my turn? No. Oh, oh, oh shit, sir. No, oh, no, I didn't. Ugh. Okay, I need to figure this out. Okay, I screwed up. All right, all right, all right, all right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to protect our king and we're going to develop our players. Hey, he actually okay. remembered what I said. We're gonna develop this our players. This might be the most so, entertaining commentary I've ever heard. Is, are is we, we even are going to I don't know. Do um, we're gonna move this guy oh. here? No. Okay. No. Oh God. Don't do it. Oh, oh no. That rook. There it is. That's that's unfortunate. Oh shit! Why didn't anybody tell me that could happen? <laughs> Okay, oh, that, I wasn't paying attention. Okay, all right. Well, that, that's insane, Alexandra. So yeah. it seems like we already have a result. We oh, we have do a... already have a result? Not this oh, game. Vinny, this game's still Vinny going. Lingham's, yeah, Vinny Lingham's opponent apparently couldn't make it. Unfortunately, that would be Peter McCormack. So Vinny Lingham wins by default. Okay. Just a uh, little bit of news. So... Let's see. I wonder which ones. I think we should check out the game between Robert Leshner and Anthony Pomp. I know that Anthony is the favorite because both of them were uh, roasting his chess on Twitter. And mm -hmm. Robert Leshner said that if he somehow ends up beating Anthony Pomp, he's going to donate $50,000 of Ethereum to charity. So he's uh -huh. a little bit of the underdog. And usually I think you get rewarded for winning, but it's nice to see that they, they care about charity. And uh, what do you think about his position so far? Um, so let me try to find the game here. It's It should be our Leshner, I think. I'm just looking for... Um, oh yeah, we're I just looking for their... Yeah, we just need to follow follow uh, Robert. Yeah, yeah. But in the meantime, as, as we're doing that, we have here open the game between um, Awachki, that would be Kevin Awachki. And uh, Kane Warwick, we got basically equal material here. Black is very, very nice. Ooh, castles long, man. We got some aggressive play styles here. Uh, let me just find Robert's game. Okay, and uh, I'll, I'll just is. take a look at this current Ooh. game. It's nice Ooh. that he finally got his king to safety. Okay, and we're on to the new game. Whoa, so we already whoa, whoa, whoa. have a fork in the center of the board. It looks like Anthony might lose his rook and his queen, but he does have a nice trick which he didn't play. I was going to say queen e7 right. so that he doesn't lose his rook. Yeah, that's a very common technique of dealing with forks where one of the pieces repositions and pins the pawn to the king. You could you could do kind of the same thing with rook e6, so that's a little bit, uh, shall we say, manka s, because uh, you never want your queen to be sort of in a hanging position. But how did we reach, Alexander, this situation? Well, we had... Uh -huh. Oh, this sign. Yeah, I'm the actually. Early rook lift. I am actually rechecking the storyline too because maybe it was the other way around. Maybe he was gonna donate fifty thousand dollars if he lost to Anthony. I think that's what actually happened. Okay, well, um, I'm gonna be completely brutally honest, with you, Alexander. I don't think Black's position looks too good. Yeah, no, it. But looks I might like be misevaluating. Black... No, 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 <laughs> Danya. That is the nicest way you put it. The position doesn't look too good. The queen is under attack. It looks like. Uh... You know, the king is stuck in the center of the board. At least the knight is protecting the bishop on his side. Oh. Oy, 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 oy. Yeah, oh, this is a disaster no. here for black. And now oh, look at this no. bishop on c8. It really, uh, it is not experiencing a very happy existence. And now what white's going to do is <laughs> reposition this knight to f5. And that Why bishop's going to be Why you got to go for the bishop soul like that? Not experiencing a nice existence. Uh, I mean... Oh, and h5. Maybe, I mean, he's going to try to lift his other rook, but it's going to be a little bit too late. If uh, Leshner plays f5, knight f5 right now, you could first take the bishop and then play knight f5. You can't take the knight because of the pin. This is basically checkmate. Oh, and you know what could happen, Alexander, is if Black castles here and tries to escape, uh, Anastasia's mate happens, which is this knight on e7 and then a piece on the h file. Is that is one Anastasia's way the game could end. Mate? So does that it mean it's called... Is it mm -hmm. when the knight is taking away the escape score and the queen comes in, or what are the themes for this mate? So the theme is it could be either a queen or a rook. So if you put a rook on h5 instead of the queen, it would still be checkmate. It would still be Anastasia's mate. The knight is the crucial piece. The king is in the corner. The knight takes away the g8 square. Uh, and generally, a pawn takes away the g7 square. Now watch this happen. <laughs> it would be hilarious. OK, we have moves. Or do we have moves? We do. Oh, gosh. Okay, okay, I think we need to switch to another. another yeah, game. I think I think we've seen what we need to see here, and we can we can move on. Uh, okay. Okay. So, I see their this... user usernames 
And I'm just going to look up who's playing. Okay, so we have Meltem Demiros. She is the MIT and Oxford professor. She's playing with the black side of the pieces. And uh, BJ Cohen is Benjamin Cohen, who has a really popular YouTube channel called Into the Cryptoverse. I think they have over 400,000 subscribers. Wow. So this is who we're watching right now. Um, Benjamin has a 1,000 rating gain, but this is very normal. The first game is usually mismatched. You're going to have somebody mm -hmm. going against someone much higher rated, but when they break off into the championship and consolation bracket, the games are going to be much more even. That is true. And as we can see here, Black has already lost uh, her queen. We had an Italian, which went a little bit wrong for Black early on, 97. Uh, Benjamin taking this pawn. Oh, and the mm -hmm. knight takes f7. That is not only a fork, but more importantly, the queen is literally just trapped on d8. No squares. And uh, unfortunately, the, the situation seems to be falling apart for uh, Professor Demiros. But yeah, the knight's going to drop back to e6. And uh, Benjamin is going to win this game very, very convincingly. Definitely. But I do think a more equal pairing in the future would maybe be if uh, we see Meltem playing against Anthony. They seem to be more similar rating, and their styles are a little bit suiting with the, the generous queen gambit from both, which, hey, no shame. I do those all the time. Indeed. Well, shall we check back in on your protege, Alexander, the stock guy? Well, uh, stock guy, have... I'd be surprised if he hasn't gotten mated yet. This is, I feel like this is intense right now. Let's listen. This is intense right now. Like, I know I'm going to lose, but like, this is intense. He's actually not doing that bad. This mm -hmm. is much better than I expected from yesterday. But that's probably because he just was roasting me being single in my hairline instead of focusing on the chest. So, oh my God, I'll put my queen there. Peace. Um, peace was lost for every roast. Oh, now here, there goes the knight. Karma oh my is sweet. Whew. My heart's beating. It should be. Yeah, he's going to lose just. Few too many pieces here. He's gonna take my yeah, knight. I shouldn't have tough. done that. That was dumb. I should have put my queen right okay, there. Okay, but he sees it. That's where I should have yeah. put my queen. Fuck. Hey, at least he, he's recovering after. And I know that he said the reason he's playing is because he wanted to do it for charity. He knew he was an underdog going in. So mm -hmm. I actually think he had a really good perspective towards this. So I, I really appreciate that as well. Um, I also did a lesson yesterday with, with Ben this Foreman. Guy has to be and he's thinking playing I'm an against Daryl Morey. So maybe we should apparently... take a look at that game. Sure, let's absolutely do that. And um, hmm, let's see. Let I'll, I'll let you find it. And his chess was actually pretty good. Um, we we're practicing some some longer uh, timed games, and he was very good at that. He struggled a bit with the time pressure, but I think this is going to be interesting because Daryl Morey obviously is a longtime chess fan. Um, I know he's been watching a lot of chess streams. You see him lurking in Hikaru's chat every now and then. So I think there mm -hmm. was some of the more evenly matched opponents in the first round. Yeah, I mean, I think at, at the very least, this is a little bit more evenly matched than some of the uh -huh. other pairings. All right. Good, good done. one, Dania. Uh, you new, you new did your work for the day. You did the entertainment. <laughs> now you can clock out. Yep, I can get some DoorDash. And, exactly. Um, yeah, so Daryl is, he's got a lot of experience. Yeah, as you said, he's done lessons with the car. And I think, Alexander, this experience is showing in the way that he's playing this game. He is playing professional chess right now. If you look mm -hmm. at this pawn structure, he's got this pawn chain. Suit and what's more imposing, look at this bishop on c2. This bishop is staring like a cannon right at Black's king. And what move is coming next? It might very well be queen to h5, creating massive threats against Foreman's king. Black is doing okay, but I'm really, really worried about the safety of Black's king here um, as his time ticks down. Queen e7. Right. Daryl should play queen h5 here. And this is very scary because if he plays queen h5, even if Ben defends with a move like g6, He's making more holes in his king side, and because the h file is open, um, Mori can just lift up his rook to d3 and try to get it to h3 to go for a checkmating uh, tactics. I also do want to give him some credit because it doesn't seem like he's playing this poorly. He's just going up against a very tough opponent, and he's playing a little bit too passively. Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly right. He hasn't blundered anything, like you said. And just uh, in this line, Alexandra, in addition to the rook lift, Daryl has a really, really cool idea. What you could do is you could try to get this knight on d2 uh, to this Swiss cheese square on f6. How could you do it? You could walk the knight to f3, then back down to h2, and all the way up to g4, and finally the knight is ready to go to f6. That's, you know, like me flying from San Francisco to, I don't know, some tiny airport in Europe. You fly through Frankfurt and then another airport. 
But white's got all the time in the world because, as you indicated, black has played a little bit too passively. It doesn't seem like uh, black has enough counterplay here to mix things up. Let's see how Daryl handles uh, the. I feel like here. you he's could write five. an action movie about chess and it would still be good. I know you've published two books already. Um, <laughs> and actually, I have an interesting fact for you. Uh, you mm -hmm. know um, how to reassess your chess, right? Yeah, Solman. Solomon, did you know that he wrote another novel as well? He did? Like a non-chess novel? A non-chess novel, and it had goats. Uh, uh, I think, I, I can't even, actually, I'm going to pull it up. I need to tell you this. You're going to be very entertained, but we can keep switching to another game because I, I cannot <laughs> do it justice without looking it up. It's called Bibliography oh, of a Goat. Bibliography of a goat. Yeah, autobiography wow. of a goat. Sorry. Okay. Autobiography. Let me read this to yeah. You. But not to be confused by bibliography, please. I'm all ears. L let me let me tell you this because you're gonna find it fascinating. So mm -hmm. obviously he's an international master and fantastic chess author. Uh, chess author. He decided to venture into fiction as well, and here is the plot. When Ellie Rubinstein marries a German woman nicknamed Beast, who may or may not be homosexual and may or may not be Hitler Youth, it is not surprising that things go horribly wrong. Um, anyway, then the, she fights in the slums of London, ends up in gay-friendly climes of San Francisco with drug and free love culture. Uh, there's UFOs and Goodness. a lot of weird things in the story. <laughs> That's insane. And Jeremy Silman, for those who don't know, he's an internet, very famous international master, very flamboyant figure. I'm sure you wouldn't be able to guess that from the plot of that novel. I didn't know that. See, I learned, th I learned new things every day. Right, because he's, he's you know, such a well-known chess author. But hey, maybe he's going to make a splash in fiction as well. I know a lot of people in my chat wanted to buy it, but there were not enough copies. So that being said, I'll let us get back to the chess. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, Matt Huang, who I gave a couple of lessons to off stream, has just checkmated Eva Bay. The 400 rating was a provisional rating. He is rated about 15, 1600. So he's definitely the favorite in this match and a very convincing victory delivered in his white game uh, as he proceeded in all, an already winning position. First, he created a massive attack against Black's King. He won the bishop. And then, uh, let me just go back really quickly to the game. He, uh, okay, the board is flipped, but he won the queen with this move. Knight f6 check, discovered attack against Black's queen picked up the queen and delivered checkmate in very convincing fashion. They are off to uh, their second game. And we've also have a couple of other results. Awachki has given, well, look at that, made Alexandra checkmate that to gain Warwick. That is beautiful. Down, Down a piece. bishop. Oh, wow. Look at that mate. Oh, and the new games are beginning, so it keeps switching. But uh, that's incredible as Awachki wins the first game against Gain Warwick. They're off to their second game. More results. Matt Huang has won. The stock guy is still playing, but he's down 8,000 gazillion pieces here. Oh my goodness, this might be the most but lopsided decision I've ever seen. But he hasn't got checkmated yet, so he's actually doing very well. Because I know some people in his stream were actually predicting and making bets that he would lose in four moves, and he proved them wrong. Yes, he did. It's 30 move long. This game can I think the he's sudden... actually <laughs> wow. the, the only streamer in this bunch of people. Wow. Well, I'm just trying to process the amount of material that White has extra, particularly after White takes the bishop and the queen. It's going to be two rooks, a queen, and three pieces. So you maybe think that's he can stalemate. Material? Maybe he can stalemate, you know? He just has to run his king to the just side. Just needs to give up the rest of his pawns. You know, he's given up most of his other ah, pieces. Well, so. shit. <laughs> All right. Yep, there we go. GG. 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 OK. I was expecting a more nuclear reaction, shall we say. Yeah, uh, I mean, he is very animated, so that does make it fun. Yeah, um, it does. But I guess we can go, do you see any games that are, are a little bit closer by any chance? Well, I think the Daryl Morey game is pretty close. Um, and we should also point out that uh, uh, Benjamin Cohen has completed uh, that attack against um, Melton uh, Demeros, and they're off to a second game. And this is a very lopsided matchup, so Benjamin is you know, on his way to another victory here. He's already up a rook and a piece. White's king is in big trouble. And now bishop f5 loads up the cannon here. Knight c3 is going to be a discovery against white's queen. So this is going to be a very surefire victory for Cohen. Uh, That's actually a very nice 
a combination that you just pointed out there. Yeah, I mean, also knight takes f2 is another threat. So what, yeah, and h4. And just he's completely going to ignoring. Yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult when you're in a position like this. You don't know what to do. And a lot of what beginners do when they're stuck is just push pawns because otherwise you end up sinking, thinking a lot of time and it's hard to come back from that. Yeah, it is. And you often, as you said, see beginners playing h4, a4. And I think part of that comes from uh, the fact that they're a little bit worried about pushing their central pawns because if you don't know, you know, if you're just beginning your chess journey, pushing pawns in front of your king may seem a lot more dangerous than pushing pawns in front of your rook. Then you start learning about chess principles. You start putting things in context. So very understandable. But Benjamin, he's a very experienced player, 1,600 plus, uh, and he's going to win this second game and get onto the uh, winner's bracket. I think the closest game actually might be uh, Awachki's battle against Kane Warwick. Yeah, um, and Awachi, I know that he's a developer in cryptocurrency, and Kane is actually one of the founders of Synthetics, which is really cool that he's playing in this tournament. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a very interesting company. But they're both close on the time. It's just two minutes difference. They're actually equal in material, opposite side castling. And Black's King seems a little bit less safe because, I mean, White's pawns are closer. He has his knight on the side but there's mm -hmm. no very serious attack that's come in right away. That's absolutely right. And definitely white is the advantage, but bishop b4, I don't love that move. And I think this gives black an opportunity to trade that path to knight. Kane going for a queen trade here. As you indicated, Alexander, his king is just a bit better placed than black's king. Black's king a little bit open. So a queen trade would be in black's favor. When you trade queens, it's a lot harder to get an attack started against the enemy king. And Awachki doing a great job here, accepting the queen trade. Here, it's going to be very important to defend the safe pawn. Go a6 or king to b8. Ooh, and he doesn't defend it. That is a pretty costly little blunder there. It yeah, doesn't he played end the game, so quickly. I think it was because quickly. of the speed. He he didn't take a lot of time. Um, and yes. he did something that's very basic, like doubling your rooks, which usually makes sense. But definitely worth slowing down a little bit. Although I like rook b5. He's going for the weak pawns. Indeed, he's still totally fine here because of these weak pawns, and he's got over 10 minutes. Remember, this is a 10-minute time control, so he's been playing literally instantly uh, like it's a bullet game. Maybe that's part of his plan. Maybe he's just hurrying a little bit too much. Uh, what is white going to do here? Rook to a4 seems like the only way to defend this pawn. That's probably what white has to do, even though this puts the rook on a very passive square. Now, one very nice idea for black here would be to reposition this bishop, go bishop to f8, Looks like we're setting up the pieces for the next game, but no, we want to push this E pawn out and orchestrate another attack against this weak B4 pawn. We'll see how this game unfolds. Rook A, Rook A4 has been played, and Kane getting his knight around to C4, and there comes Bishop F8 by Awachki. He sees the idea, although it's a little bit later than he should have. Right, and he shouldn't have pushed his pawn to F5. It was a little bit unnecessary because now if he pushes his uh, e pawn, he's going to have those weak dark holes allowing the knight to e5, and he can never kick the knight out of there with another pawn. That's right. And to add insult to injury, if e6, which watch, he probably will play, the knight could swing back to d3 and uh, lend reinforcements to this b4 pawn. But as you said, that knight on e5 is also a very powerful outpost. So this is going to be close. e6 has been played. I'm Absolutely. curious if Kane is going to see knight d3. Nope, he goes rook a7. Kane going seems very offensive. underrated, actually. 874. Uh, do you think this is his accurate rating? No. I think he's playing like a solid 13, 1400 here. Yeah. Uh, have you ever tried playing Guess the Elo when you look at people's games and you try to come up with their rating? I haven't, but I was I was uh, watching with avid enthusiasm uh, you and Ikari doing that, and then I immediately got the desire to do it myself. I was because totally it's off. It's so fun. I was totally off, but if you want to do it in the future, I would love to to do that. Oh, a done deal. I that's that looks so fun. Um, I feel like I'm you would totally be so accurate. It would be awesome to see. <laughs> well, you know, some people call me the prophet. I I have to. Uh, some continually... people call me the prophet. Yes, your followers. <laughs> if there was a modesty contest, I would win it, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, in any case, we got a Kane really putting pressure on Awachki, but Awachki rook to d8, very nice defensive move, mm -hmm. uh, shutting down this rook. A draw is entirely in Awachki's favor because he favor because he wins the mini match in the event of a draw. We will monitor Kane's attempts to mix this end game up and ultimately even out 
this match. But let's take a look at I some of the other I was going to just say one time. thing before we go. It Please. would have been a lot better for him if he played Rook A3 instead of trading his Rook, especially because he needs to play for a win. So what he should be trying to do here is keep as many pieces on the board. Uh, that being said, he still has some chances to push for a win. And now we can hop on over to the other game. Absolutely. Uh, we will keep an eye on this one. Shall we take another quick peek at Daryl Morey's attacking effort against Foreman? Absolutely. Well, uh, this is a look at this bishop. First of all, white is now up a piece. Mm -hmm. As we kind of predicted, what ended up happening is that Daryl put his queen on h6. And Alexandra, you, you must have given this guy some lessons. You called it. Here comes rookie three. Look at that. Black panics a little bit with f6. Daryl simply takes the knight, completes the rook lifts trades the rooks, and he doesn't even want to trade the queens. He doesn't need to because white's the one attacking here. Look at yeah. how convincingly he's conducting this king up to rook h1. Are you kidding me? I mean, me? He, white is just playing so strongly here. And I mean, I did one lesson with Ben, and I'm not trying to take any credit for how well he's playing. It just gave me insight into his chess abilities. And I actually think that he would do very well in classical chess. He's mm -hmm. been holding very well under the pressure, and he's just playing an opponent who's higher rated. So the fact that he was still able to fend off the attack, I think, is very mm -hmm. impressive. And I'm curious to see um, how uh, Daryl Morey is going to continue from here, because even though he's up a bishop, the position is still closed. So maybe he can simplify and just win a pawn on the queen side, but he might not have a, a mating technique right away. Indeed, and I think he's just going after the material, as you said. The time situation in White's favor, but I don't know how comfortable Daryl is with rapid time controls. One way, and I love Queen G7, you're, I mean, Ben is defending so admirably here, creating counter chances. Uh, just a quick note that a faster way to win here would have been to slide the rook up to H6. You're basically just trying to snap off this pawn on mm -hmm. G6. This would have led to basically devastating uh, attacking threats. One very cute line. If uh, king up to g7, you can still take that pawn. What does this do? This opens up the h file. Bishop comes back to e5, and regardless of where the king moves, you checkmate them on h. Oh, that so. is gorgeous. So I guess there was a mating uh, idea over there, but it was one that was pretty tricky to see, especially under two Indeed. minutes on the clock. Daryl, very calm, and he decides just to push his pass pawn. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's a perfectly viable winning method, but. Definitely hats off Alexander to, to Ben for staying afloat um, and keeping the game going. This might be the longest running first round matchup. It definitely uh, first, first is. Game. This is the only first round game that hasn't had a result yet. You know what has had, had a result? Um, stock guy kind of had a little trouble that in the second fun. game as well. I don't, I, can, can, I, can somebody explain to me what I did wrong here? I, I, I guess I didn't notice the knight was there. Well, where where to start, you know? <laughs> That's a very loaded question. Oh, man. We, by the way, we had one more matchup that as we, well, let's, let, we can listen for a couple more seconds. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think we're back now. So let me look at which okay. matchups are still going on. It looks like Matt Huang and Eva are, are still playing. Ava, sorry. Ava and Matt Huang, and it's a closer. Oh, as a, just as I was Oh, my it's gosh. Hey, Commentator's curse. Ooh, that was actually I'm Ava sorry. was up a night. She was winning here, and then she it blundered her. She could have just taken with yeah. a queen. And yeah, she's up, and not only is she up a night, but this knight is coming into F six, a devastating attack. Completely attacking winning, king. and she needed this win oh, man. to equalize. So that is actually really heartbreaking Ooh. to see. Oof, 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 and that is a full queen. And of course, White could keep playing. She's probably going to bring the knight back to e4, but that's that's unfortunately very, very hard to come back from. And Matt Huang, really by, by the skin of his teeth, is going to, looks like, is going to advance to the winner's bracket. Wow. Uh, okay. That's heartbreaking. That is heartbreaking. Um, just to quick, uh, quickly check in on the Iwachki game, unfortunately for Kane, it just looks like he hasn't manufactured the requisite winning chances. This is a dead draw. We have three pawns against three pawns and rooks on the board. It's, so if I'm, you were playing yeah. this, and I'm going to put you in a very tough position Please. here, Danya, I you need to win. Otherwise, nothing happens. What is the trickiest thing you could at least try? Uh -huh. Because you're, you're not at risk of losing, but it's an equal end game, and you know, you're both around 12, 1300. Alexandra, I don't like the implication that you think I would know, like I'm a dirty player, like I ever 
try to win these positions on time. I, I would never, never do such a thing, right? Never, I don't even play you bullet. You never anymore. flag anybody with a king and a rook versus a king and a rook, <laughs> let's say. No, never. No, that is only for dirty players. I'm not one of them. So, unfortunately, a watch, unfortunately for Kane, Awachki playing very, very uh, convincingly. E5 trading off another pair of pawns. What would I do if I absolutely had to try? Because Awachki is playing so quickly, I would basically make 20, 25 moves with my rook, hoping for some sort of a pre-move or maybe, you know, he accidentally pre-moves rookie four. Uh, you know, when you play this fast, I know it sounds crazy, but sometimes you make a bad pre-move uh, or you play a little too hastily. Kane playing G4, he's trading pawns, and unfortunately, he's just not going to make it happen here. Now we have one pawn each, and one thing a watch you could do is just drop the rook back to E5 and then go G5, which is exactly what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to lead to just... Uh, Unfortunately, the trade of the other pawns. He could have gone rook f5 here. Just nothing that you can do. And rook f5 makes the draw immediately. In there this you position. go. Rook f5. Um... Or g5. Yeah, he's going to prepare g5 instead. Oh, I would uh... go king g4. King g4? Uh, that, that hey, at least that gives you some chances. If you could win a Hoping pawn. For this. I mean, this is still technically a draw, but you'd have to have the right technique, so... Here's another funny thing. If the rook was on f8 here, this would have been checkmate. So right. I, what I would do, if he goes back to h6 here, okay, it goes g5. So this game is going to be a draw. Yep. Okay. Five dreams, five dreams, five dreams. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, we, we we did play it up a little bit. It's always fun to be the commentators looking at these drawn positions, just hoping something crazy is going to happen. Indeed. And one one just matchup we haven't been watching. We apologize for that. Uh, Tekken, Tekken Salimi... Uh, defeated David uh, Goshen pretty convincingly. So that's just a little bit of an update there. And Kane and Awachi have officially drawn their game. Hey, he tried. Bear Kings indicates that he did his best. All right. Well, we have a new game here. So what? who is this game in between? I'm trying to tell from <laughs> the usernames. I think he's just... I think... Uh, uh, Surajit is just playing somebody else in the pool. Okay, yeah, I, I, so I didn't recognize it. the silly 659. <laughs> like, who That's is hilarious. this newcomer? I don't, I don't see them on the list. Okay, he's Indeed. been practicing. So yeah. Wow. That's uh, that's pretty impressive. Like, you know, I haven't had enough. I'm jumping straight back into the pool, and we have Benjamin uh, Cohen officially defeating uh, Meltem with a score of two zero. He is definitely, I would say, the the favorite given how convincingly he played but daryl Morey, don't sleep on him he just played a brilliant first round game he mm -hmm. defeated uh foreman and now ben with a must-win situation with the white pieces as they have just kicked off their second game all right well this is going to be probably the closest matchup of the first round and uh ben has a very nice initial position it looks like he's playing against a perts he has the pawns in the center this looks really nice you usually see uh higher rated players playing this with black it is very tricky to do properly though and i personally hate playing this variation with black it's just so awkward to develop your pieces and challenge the center yeah it's a uh, very very hard opening to play any opening where you where you basically yield control of the center Mm -hmm. is going to be hard to play because you need to be very, very careful that you don't let your opponent's central control mushroom. And, you know, all the time you have to deal with ideas like E4 to E5, expanding in the center. So one of the ideas of this cryptic, cryptic, crypto, cryptic move C6, Alexandra, you, th that was a genius fun, and you're supposed to acknowledge that. I Thank you. I smiled. I smiled. Uh, okay, fine. I'll, I'll let you slide. Puns on. are usually something that invokes a smile, not like, ah, ha, 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 I'm rolling, you know? <laughs> it was just a Bitcoin funny. Um, <laughs> okay, that was good. That was good. But that pun was so bad that it really just needs to dissipate into the ether or ether. <laughs> you're, you're just going to keep done. going. Uh, I'm, keep done. Going. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I, I think we have a 10 pun limit on the show, so you're getting very close. Okay, but you know what, Alexander? I was about to lead you in because before the show, you were talking about something having to do with Ethereum. Let's say, for example, that I'm somebody I know nothing about cryptocurrency, which I really don't. And if only there was some sort of a podcast or show that was dedicated to exposing uh, more truths and knowledge about it, but is there such a thing? 
Yes, thank you for leading me in, Danya. I have talked a little bit about this on my stream, but I am launching a podcast, my first ever podcast, and it is an educational podcast about Ethereum that makes learning about it accessible for everyone, regardless of their technical background. And the way it works is I'm co-hosting it with one of my good friends who I've known for almost 10 years. He studied computer science at an Ivy League university, worked at top tech companies, but then decided to go full-time working in the Ethereum community since 2016. So he's an industry expert and we would catch up say once every two weeks. And I was learning so much from him that we basically decided to turn it into a podcast in case other people want to learn as well. It's a passion project. It's not sponsored. And the first episode is going to be out tomorrow. Wow. I'll definitely be watching. I, the moment I hear words like blockchain or, you know, mining, my eyes sort of glaze over, but I don't want them to. So I'll definitely be tuning in and, uh, I'm going to take you, know. you up on that. I expect to get oh. a five-star review from you, Danya. No pressure. You absolutely will. Um, you know, just do a good job because I've been known to give sprinkle in three and four stars. No, actually you should, you should, you should give your, your real star. I, I think if it's, uh, I, I'd like real feedback from the master, but we can get back to the chess Noted. now. Um, so let's do it. It looks like uh, Daryl is doing a really good job getting more space on the queen side. And now he's breaking in the center as well. That is a very committal decision. What do you think about e5? Yeah, I mean, e5 is pretty normal in these positions because, again, Andrea, your all... alarm. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. No problem. Ultimately, white is beginning to threaten the move e5. Let's say for a, for a second that black would have fianchetto developed the last remaining piece. What can happen? White pushes in the center e5. Let's say we have a trade. And then let's say black says, no problem. I'm just going to move my knight back. This pawn seems to be a pretty big weakness. Well, guess what white could do? We could use this pawn as a battering ram e6, shattering the pawn structure around black's king. After f takes e6, the bishop snaps off the pawn. Look at how terrible black's pawn structure is. This is no good. So Daryl, I think, chose the exactly the right moment to strike in the center and prevent the progress of white's pawns. The drawback of this move is that the bishop on g7 is now sort of biting on granite, but that's okay. I like how Daryl has handled the position. He's got space on the queen side, space in the center. But Benjamin, also very classy development. He can now play a move like queen to d2 in order to connect his rooks and attack the pawn. So the position is approximately equal, Alexander. Absolutely. And one thing that we did yesterday in our lesson is talk about options when you have the opportunity to trade. And the fact that he played queen d2 and kept the tension in the center just shows how you know well-versed he's becoming in these concepts. It's awesome that he didn't take. This is a much more difficult situation for black to play now. Indeed. And Daryl has to defend this pawn. And the usual way to do that is to go king to h7, using the king in order to support the pawn. What you don't want to do is play a move like h5 that allows white to slide the bishop into h6, uh, forcing the trade of bishops. Very typical idea and uh, weakening Black's king. So we'll see how Daryl handles this. Alexa, Alexa, I'm commentating. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, our, I ours own. went off earlier as well because, you know, Andrea's alarm clock. So it's good. We're on the same page. We are. We are. No, I, always at the wrong moments, too. True. See, true. when I want a reminder, it doesn't say anything. When I don't, uh, commentate. <laughs> so unprofessional. <sighs> Bless you. Excuse me. All right. Um, so do we have any other games? I mean, I think we should stick to the, no, it looks like all of the other results, um, have been finished. This is the only one still going and most of them were 2-0, except for, uh, Kevin Owaki versus Kane Warwick. That one was a little bit closer. And this one also has the best chance to maybe not be a clear 2-0 for, for Daryl, just because uh, his opponent is uh, much closer to him in terms of level. Indeed. And uh, Daryl has decided to take, which I believe is, believe it or not, a mistake. Now, why is it a mistake? Because now there is all of a sudden a doubled attack. The knight is attacking the pawn. The bishop is attacking this other pawn. And if Daryl goes c5, maybe he was relying on this. This is a very common mistake. You push a pawn and you forget that there's another pawn, which then ends up being undefended. Right. So knight simply takes this pawn and then the d6 pawn is weak. The position falls apart. If I were Daryl here, I would be in damage control mode. I would defend the C6 pawn. At this point, this pawn is more important uh, because it anchors the entire structure. Mm -hmm. well, let me tell you, he's in some trouble here and his time is ticking down as well. Yeah, absolutely. I like the idea of giving the H6 pawn up. Obviously, it's going to end up being a weakness if they get later on to the end game where being down a pawn actually matters. But 
if he loses the bishop on h6 and tries to keep it a little bit more closed, at least it does give him uh, some chance to develop his pieces and keep his center pawns intact. All right, right more yeah. coffee. You've been drinking so much coffee. Oh. I'm surprised you're not bouncing off the walls. I, I am. I'm, I'm full of, I'm, I'm, I am. I'm like, I want to get off my chair and walk around. Um, but yeah, I had a, like a triple or quadruple espresso earlier and now I'm getting iced coffee. I'm, I'm Do you even feel the effects of caffeine still? Yes. Um, but it's not that I feel the effects of caffeine, but like any caffeine addict, it's, I feel the effect of not having it. Yes. The lack uh, of is, is scarier. Oh, it is. Now, if I didn't yeah. have coffee, I would be, I wouldn't be able to say a single, single thing properly. Not that I. I'm coherent even with no, coffee, I, I I understand that. I mean, most of my high school and college experience, if I didn't have a huge coffee with me, I would fall asleep in class. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah, but you went to a very easy school. So I, I know, did go to a very easy school um, with a with a professor who, you know, was very intimidating if you ever <laughs> fell asleep. Oh, he was he was really on the name mark with that one. <laughs> um, I, I love that only the two of us are going to get that joke, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Well, people can Google. I mean, he was actually, this is a professor uh, who, who taught, he was my advisor, my, my major advisor. So yeah. And uh, I very... took a class with him as mm -hmm. well. So that's why I recognize his name. Yeah. Very sweet professor in his seventies, you know, leading scholar on European history, but man, oh man, if you were on your phone during class, he was very old school about it. I was saying it wasn't just, oh, please stop texting. You know, I want you to pay attention. No, 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 no. no. I'm going to take that machine, and he would call the phone the machine, and I'm going to take that machine, and you're not going to see the inside of the lecture hall again. I Neither know. is your phone. He was, he was so fun. It really felt like an oh, old yeah. school. It felt like what you expect history teachers to be. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, man, fun times, fun times. Absolutely. And uh, I actually see somebody in the chat say, anybody here into crypto or just watching because of the chess? Well, for those of you watching on chess.com events, uh, it's good to see you. Somebody said, I'm into Pomp. He's my idol. That's why I'm here. Well, Pomp does have a lot of star power, Pons, don't lie. He did have a tough starting game, but mm -hmm. uh, he's going to be paired with somebody who's closer to his rating in the second game. So for those of you who are watching because you look up to these people or you follow what's going on, uh, it's really nice to have you guys here and welcome to the chess community. Indeed. Um, everyone is welcome. This has been a fun tournament. We hope you've been having a fun time. Uh, so many colorful and um, accomplished figures in uh, in this tournament. So it's uh, really an honor to be watching. And yeah, Anthony had a tough first round. Let's just say there wasn't a lot of pomp and circumstance in his first round matchup. Have I leech? Have I leech my limit? I'm going to reach my limit. I was limit about yet. to say you reach your limit. <laughs> I might have to start making puns too just to keep up. Yeah, I mean, I'm way ahead of you right now. But we have <laughs> You are. Slightly... It's not a competition done. <laughs> Who's to say that? But you know what is a comp? There's a trap your night competition, which Daryl Morey might be winning right now. Uh, ben made a very forgivable mistake. He just took a second pawn. So what happened here? Daryl played c5. He took on b5 and went knight e5. And Ben grabbed the pawn on h6. But here's the issue. Look at this knight on b5 for a second. It looks like an excellent knight is uh, pressuring the pawn. But wait a minute. If black plays a6 here, the knight has absolutely no escape squares. Can't go back to b4. The other knight is covering c3. The pawn is covering a3, and the queen is defending d6. So what even if you trade bishops, for the b5 knight, looks like it's there. We go. There. That's, That's what I've been waiting for all stream long. <laughs> I got you, Johnny. I'm backing you up with the puns. <laughs> that was excellent. That was excellent. I my compliments. And he's going to have to give up the knight for a pawn. This is not the end of the world, uh, because White has by now three pawns for the peach, but not uh, what. Ooh, but Daryl, no, he takes on a3. Look at that move, Alexander. That's not an amazing move, but uh, it's so cool that he spots this. Uh, I'm pretty impressed, even if it's not the best move objectively. Yeah, I mean, this is a very tricky move because what he's trying to do is if g takes h3, he can play his knights to f3. But the problem is that white doesn't have to recapture, and he might miss the opportunity of trapping the knight on b5. So he did get distracted by a pretty tactic. And he actually missed the stronger tactic that was right in front of him. Yep. He got attracted by the sweet nectar of, of the sacrifice of one way that Ben could deal with the situation. He could trade bishops first, mm -hmm. and he could play the move f4. As you said, he doesn't have to take the bishop. This attacks the knight. If the knight moves, then you could take the bishop. And if the knight takes on d3, then you could simply recapture. Now the bishop is hanging, and this pawn on d6 is also hanging, and the knight 
uh, as, as you said, the uh, opportunity train is going to depart on that one. So let's see how Ven reacts here. He does take on g7. Will he find f4? Or, or simply stepping back with the bishop, another excellent move here. I think he's going to find one of these moves. And uh, he's actually doing pretty well on the clock as well. Uh, in the last game, he was down about a minute and a half, but it is a lot harder to defend than it is to attack, whereas here he has a much simpler position. So I'm curious how he's going to do in the time pressure uh, situation. That was one of his weaknesses that he was still working on yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's a common thing, right, Alexander? When you're mm -hmm. first, even when you're not that experienced, it, given a lot of time, you can find the right move, but there tends to be a lot of panic associated with going under like one, two, one minute. And then eventually you start getting addicted to bullet and one minute seems like an eternity. Yeah, look, we have the uh, poster child of bullet addiction uh, right here on stream. Yes, Mr. Yes, Daniel yes. Naraditsky, good to see you. Uh, have you played a lot of 15 <laughs> second chess lately? I'm not going to comment on that. I, I'm retired. From, I'm 25. Who do you think I am? You think I'm one of those teenagers, you know, into into 30 second chess? No, no, no. Right. Flagging right. and rook versus rook. I think you've got the wrong, wrong, wrong notes today. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, so so coming back to this game, of course, it is very normal to not be familiar with time pressure. It happens to everyone. Um, it's nice to see the progress here, and I like what Darren Mori is trying to do with. Uh, Maybe in the future, he'll at least try to get his rook onto h8. Obviously, he had to recapture on g7 with the king. But that's actually a square where his king may have wanted to be regardless to open up the h8 square for his rook. Yeah, and what's amazing, uh, Alexander, is that if we rewind back to the previous game, in, in this position already up a piece, guess what Daryl did? He put king f2 and rook h1. So uh, it's very funny how he found this idea on his own. Here, uh, this very same idea could stem naturally from uh, from simply capturing the bishop. So he's definitely aware of the h file. And uh, a move has been played, and it's knight to e2. And I guess he's trying to open up the c3 square for his other knight, but this is a little bit on the path of side. Yeah. Um, it is a little bit passive, and it's, it's, it's still understandable, though. And I think it's more important that he found that he's not going to be trapping his knight. And at least his knight can hop over to the defense of his king. Um, C4, that is a move that looks like the bishop is being trapped here, Ooh. probably because it is. It is, and White, you know, it's not the knight on B5 that gets trapped. Daryl missed that, but he doesn't miss the bishop getting trapped. This is so funny because both bishops are hanging, but look at this knight on E5. It's a hero. What it is, is it doing? It is a hero. It's controlling the F3 square and defending that pawn. So if the bishop were to take the pawn, if you were to say, ah, mm -hmm. what I'm going to do, I'm going to distract the knight and then I'm going to take the bishop. But no, the queen is hanging. So right. white doesn't get any of it. Although maybe in that situation, uh, after knight takes c4, you have queen c3 attacking the bishop on h3 and the bishop uh, and the knight on c4. So at least uh, you can recover a piece. And oh, oh no. no. I was also going to say knight f4 was interesting because then if the bishop gets taken, uh, Ben would have been able to recapture on h3, but he missed. He took the bishop. He forgot about the fork. And well... We've seen a lot of queen blunders today. Uh, I'm worried that they're going to uh, impact my style of play, and I might start doing these as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they I, I might never do otherwise. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, they Ooh. heard about a certain gambit, and well, gambit sounds pretty good, so it's it's your fault. It's your fault. It, it, and it definitely is my fault. <laughs> you know what the funny thing is? It as if it weren't enough to lose your queen, that knight would still end up trapping the bishop. It would defend the pawn from the other side. And so uh, Ben, he resigns, and he's just going to be down a full queen here. So Daryl wins. That's rough. That's rough. He played fight. such a good game, and uh, just not, not a lot you could do in this situation. Indeed. And uh, that concludes the first round matchups, and we had some really, really interesting ones. Wow. Lots and lots of action uh, in that first round, Alexandra. Any uh, flash thoughts before we go on to a quick break? Um, I guess I was not surprised to see that these were very lopsided matches to begin with. We saw a lot of two zeros, but that is very normal. I just want to remind everybody that um, in the second day tomorrow, players are going to be divided into two brackets. You're going to have the championship bracket and the consolation bracket, and then the games are going to be a lot more even because everybody likes to see you know games where there's a fight rather than a massacre, which is not what I'm saying happened. Um, but on that note, we will... Be back very soon. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be off with the games.
three, two, one.
welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Crypto Champs 2021, powered by Coinbase. Before we jump into the very oh, exciting... Sorry. That was Andrea, but what's very exciting? <laughs> what is very exciting is a monthly event called Chess Done Quick. Uh, this is a monthly event. The next one is June 28th. It offers streamers a chance to participate in a speed run like format with a different theme each month. Uh, I believe that the theme for this month's Chess Done Quick is Bullet Chess. So who doesn't like who doesn't love Bullet? Who doesn't love streaming? Mark your calendars, June 28th, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Chess Done Quick, coming right up. Um, really exciting event. But now, Alexandra, let's review the uh, the consolation and the winners bracket. Let's talk about some of these exciting matchups in the quarterfinals. Absolutely. So we are heading into the quarterfinals just now we are going to have one more mini match in between all of the players today we actually already know that um uh, meltum is moving forward no i think that's actually not correct unless it was peter who didn't show up ah uh, yes i think peter didn't show up which is why right. meltum is moving on right away but for the other brackets we are going to see what's what's uh, going on so we have different pairings they're going to be a little bit closer this time around so maybe we could take a look at some of the, the pairings unless the game's already started. Uh, I think we probably have a couple of minutes. So yeah, we got, wow, we got Maury uh, in the winner's bracket. We got Robert uh, Huang, who's pretty strong. Don't sleep on him. He's playing against uh, Robert Lesh. And we'll review the matchups as we start looking at the games. And the consolation bracket has just begun. The winner's bracket will start approximately two minutes afterward. On the screen here is... Eva Bay, who had a, did a very admirable job, Alexander, against Swan, against Kane Warwick, who, of course, the most underrated 800 in history. Yeah, he is not an 800. He's more like 1,200. But Ava, as well, played very well against Matt. She actually had a winning position until we tuned in and uh, saw that very unfortunate moment where she blundered her queen when she could have been up a piece. But now is her time for revenge. And I think this is going to be a very close game, although Queen D6 is a little bit of a suspicious opener. Yeah, and she definitely did keep Kevin at bay. Um, so. Yeah, you could say that Kane is going to be at war with Ava. Oh, my goodness. Oh, was that I, bad? Is... You told me to try the puns, Danya. It was, it was as bad can't as can't be the... choosers. I mean... That is the story of Cain and Abel. Um, okay, I think I'll be able to commentate on the games now. Now, Ava, with a very interesting concept, she's trying to push e5, striking in the center. Now, that's a good idea. That's what you generally want to do. The thing that worries me about the way she's handling this is the fact that Black is not developing. She's not developing her pieces. And once the center opens up, and that's what Warwick is doing, uh, Black has only one piece developed, and it's not the piece you want to develop. It's just the queen. What would I do if I were Kane? I would strike with e4. You might be looking at this saying, wait a second, that just blunders a pawn. And then I'm going to blunder a bishop. But no, it's not a blunder because notice how the queen and the king are on the same file. Rook slides on over to e1, winning the queen. So if I were Kane, I would try to open that center up as quickly as possible. He does play a more casual move, knight e2, but I think he's going to play e4 on the next move. And Ava, she's still not developing. This is going to get tough. Yeah, it is tough. She played a6. She's playing very passively, but her only piece out, as you mentioned, is the queen. I was actually expecting bishop d6 to at least, you know, go for a checkmate threat on h2. But now retreating onto e6 is also questionable because this is why you don't bring your queen out early. It can get attacked very easily and you end up losing time. Meanwhile, uh, white is just improving the position of her knight and she's also blocking her bishop on c8 right now. Still not down any material and she can recover if she realizes that she has to develop quickly. Yeah, queen f6 is a great move. Then bishop comes out. And if she manages to castle, that's a perfectly uh, perfectly serviceable position. e4, by the way, is still possible here. Because if you take the knight, there's this discover check against the queen. That's a check against the king. And then uh, the queen is, is, is going to be lost. Uh, but that's a difficult idea to spot. Kane going c4, so he understands the correct concept. I really like mm -hmm. this move as well. Uh, we'll keep an eye on how this game proceeds. We had another game begin. It's the game between David uh, Gerstein and uh, Benjamin Foreman, uh, who did a phenomenal job holding together, holding his own against Daryl Morey. Yeah, and I don't think that we saw David's games in the first round, unless I'm missing something. 
Yeah, we didn't we didn't have a chance to look at it. I don't think we had enough. We apologize for that. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was a pretty competitive match. Uh, I don't remember. Let me check who he he played. Let's see. Um, not Sergi Chatterjee. Oh, Tekken Salimi. Tekken Salimi, very mm -hmm. accomplished player. Uh, and an interesting opening setup adopted here by uh, David. Yeah, and uh, he's playing very aggressively here. He's delaying his castle to go for a kingside attack. Um, however, it looks like he just dropped a pawn on e5, so he should have kept the tension over there. Now Ben is definitely going to be having the advantage, but he's probably still uh, you know, in a little bit of psychological pain from blundering his queen the last game, so I hope he's been able to get in a good headspace. Yeah, well, I mean, he's playing super well so far. We also want to check in on the game between... Oh, wait, this is... Um, is this the stock guy who's... This is not the game between stock guy and no, uh, this isn't, Anthony but... Pomp. This is Foreman, but we, but we, we want to check in on it. we should switch to it, yeah, because we actually have both of their cameras, so let's check in on how they're doing. Okay, let me see if I can pull that game up. I apologize for the delay. I'm having a hard time finding him. I think... Oh, because is he just stock guy or is he the stock guy? Let's see. Uh, um, yeah, I think his his chess.com username is the stock guy. The stock guy. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not finding him for some reason. Maybe he's offline for the time being. Let's see if our producers can check in on this. In the meantime, yeah, we'll, we're still, we'll get that game up and running for you because who can uh, pass up on the entertainment provided by the stock guy? Right. Um, I mean, he's always, even if he's not making the best moves, he does have his funny jokes. So I think we're actually going to take a quick listen in on his stream and see what he's saying. And I pulled up the game as we do. He's camping. Uh, can you go back to the my video? first weekend stream and you're disappointing me? Yeah. Sir, this is a, this is a, okay. Oh, oh, we're playing. We're playing. We're live. We're live. We're live. Okay. Um, try to remember everything I learned. Well, I actually found it. I just opened up the web app instead of the okay. iPhone app and now I think I'm in it. Yeah. Just through the web interface, but I can do the app if that's preferable. No, no, no. Web interface is fine. Are they talking to each other? Why do we always hear the producers when we go to okay, his okay. stream? Right. Roji, if you're ready. <laughs> hey, it's giving you behind the scenes look. The very VIP absolutely. exclusive content everybody is watching. Top tickets, absolutely. Also, chat, look alive, say hello. We see you. We hope you're having a good time. Indeed. Um and if you guys have any questions, ask in chat. We appreciate everybody watching. So much love and good to see you, Aquila and Amen. Yeah, and Grandmaster, Grandmaster Feingold. I, I, I saw a chess weave in there as well. Oh, I thought I lost a piece already. Uh, we got to hop in chat. We do. Okay. Chat Chat is so cozy right now. Absolutely. Yep. Happy, uh, is it Saturday? I think it's Saturday. Happy Saturday to everybody. Hope everyone's having a great weekend. Um, maybe enjoying this with some brunch. Okay, it's too late for lunch, unless you're a DGen streamer like me. Uh, yeah, Donnie, not everyone wakes up at 2 p.m. <clears throat> I uh, was up at 9.30 a.m., Alexander. Thank you. That's true. You were doing a lesson on probably very little sleep, so I actually respect <laughs> it a lot. And oh, it looks like Anthony actually just uh, trapped his bishop here. If stock guy, did he just play it or did you show it? No, I showed it. I, he hasn't played it yet. But I would invest in Bishop stocks right now. If he finds B, he doesn't find it. But uh, we're, maybe he'll discover it on the next move. It's not easy, Alexander, to untangle this bishop. And I don't think uh, Anthony is seeing it. Yeah, I mean, B5 still an option here. The bishop on A4 has nowhere to go. But the stock guy hasn't seen it. And it looks like he hasn't said anything about it yet because he's hovering over his F6 knight which is weird because he shouldn't be retreating it. But again, he's very new in chess. So yeah, now I think maybe Pomp will go queen h5 here. That seems to be what he's loading up. Or, or queen f3 attacking the f pawn. There comes queen h5. Uh, and this is a very, very dangerous situation for the stock. I, I really hope he doesn't castle Alexander. That is something I've seen people do. But let me stop jinxing people. He should probably just take this knight right out of commission or you go g6. Please don't castle. Okay, he's hovering over the G-pawn, so I think we're fine. Yeah, that's a great move. Um, he's going to attack the queen. He's going to defend against F7. And oh my gosh, we have Daryl Morey gifting five subs to the community. Daryl, thank you so much. And you, really nice games against Ben. The last one was a very nice comeback uh, with your Bishop Takes H3 idea. We hope you're doing well, and we appreciate you being a part of the chess community for so long. 
Yeah, we do. We he were says very... he has nothing else to do right now. I think he's joking. <laughs> where, where's, where, how's his game going? <laughs> well, I think his game hasn't started yet, but it's it's going to start in a little bit. Uh, but um, wow, that was a very impressive first game. Good, well-conducted attack. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Daryl just really doesn't have anything to do on a daily basis. He doesn't have any basketball teams to manage. Right. Yeah, he's not a busy guy at no. all. The fact nope. that he cleared his schedule for this tournament, and not just Daryl, but everybody playing in this tournament is super busy, super successful, and uh, they're out here playing chess, which is awesome. It's good that Anthony moved his knight to g5 as well. It was hanging. Um, he's threatening checkmate on h7, so stock guy is probably going to have to push one of his pawns and that's even problematic because if he pushes something like h6, queen g6 actually looks pretty scary. Yeah, and there's something I should point out earlier. Uh, the stock guy played bishop f6. He ignored the threat, and white could have taken this with the queen. It's understandable why you would take it with a knight trying to attack the rook, but this was checkmate in two moves. Queen takes f7 and knight to e6. This is simply checkmate, kind of a form of a smothered mate. So uh, Palm missed this early mate. And now the game, be oh, no, 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 no. What just happened? Oh, the stock guy blundered oh. made and won. But is he going to see it? He's still thinking. I think this he's is... going to see it. I think he's going to see it. Oh, man. Can this we is... get his oh, reaction, he if possible? It. He missed it. Oh. Does, he, does the stock guy see it? Come on, come on. Find the mate. Six. No, he played Bishop A3. <laughs> oh, gosh. Buckle your seat, multi bit again. Oh, man. Well, and he looks so focused, too. Like, he's having some really, really deep thoughts about getting checkmated on H7. He doesn't... The thing he that worries me is much. one of them is going to see it eventually, and then they're going to fall out of their chairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to get both of their reactions, but um, this is going to have to do yeah, for now. You come back on camera, possibly? We're going to see Daryl and Ben Callen. That's a matchup of the heavy hitters. That's about to begin. Um, Daryl Mori is saying, give me uh, the <laughs> scout on my next opponent. Do we know actually who he's playing next? I think he's playing uh, uh, Benjamin Cohen. Yep, can I just start? Benjamin so Cohen. Ah, okay. You better go prepare, Daryl. Pretty strong opponent, and the game has begun. Good luck to the both of them. He's yeah, good luck. He took with the knight? Oh, oh. man. Oh my goodness. And I wonder, oh man, now the stock guy is winning if he now just takes on d6 and mops up all these pieces. Uh, yes, and he was hovering. Oh, oh but he, but he but he found... chain, that's another maiden one. That's, Knight yeah, takes up six. Instead of winning, he found the helpmate. Um, actually, as a kid, I remember there were some tactics that were helpmates that I think I used to do for GG, fun. Guys, so, you know, maybe GG. he's been training those. At least you don't have to see me go through this again tomorrow. Ambulance? I, I, I don't That's hear it, the, but I see it. That's Now you're going to hear it. That's for the uh, Black King here. Oh, man. This is brutal. But again, uh, you know, he had no experience. He wanted to play for the charity. I like roasting him because of what oh. happened yesterday. But that all, all being said, it's a very good attitude to go and participate in something even when you know mm -hmm. you're a huge underdog. That's absolutely true. And, you know, we like to joke. We like to have fun. But... Uh, to echo your your sentiment, Alexandra, uh, you know some of these players they, they manage basketball teams, they manage uh, million dollar portfolios, they uh, assuage the concerns of clients who have wildly fluctuating Bitcoin accounts. But when they sit in front of a chess, when anybody sits in front of a chess board, as white blood as a queen, the <gasps> anxiety, the nervousness comes in. So we appreciate them making this effort, but that's a blunder. That's checkmate, right? is going on here it is it's not it's checkmate it's wait does he s oh well, god he's hard to see it because this clock is still running yeah he, he oh there we go he saw it he took the he queen takes it. yeah i actually don't know what's gonna happen in this game it's complete black box yes yes it is well look they are actually having fun which is what this event is meant to be and it's always right. more fun when it's a little bit chaotic right yeah, 100% right. And any literally anything could happen. We'll keep an eye on this game. But let's take a look, Alexandra, at uh, the final matchups in the winner's bracket that have just begun. First and foremost, we, of course, have uh, Benjamin Cohn of the White Pieces against Daryl Morey. He was repeating the Pertz line that he played in 
um, the second game of his match against Foreman. And what tips would you give him if he's going to continue playing this defense as black? So I think he's already doing a, a better job. I liked the fact that he played E5 quickly. I think pushing the pawn out to H6 is a little bit risky. So I would be a lot more careful about that move if I were him. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you always have to watch for this move E5. In fact, Alexander, I would play E5 in this very position if I were white, because you're not going to get too many chances to do that. And like I showed previously, that pawn could slide up all the way to E6. It could wreak havoc on black setup. This is a very dangerous line that Daryl has chosen to play here. So if Black were to recapture, so E5, D takes E5, I guess they moved on. But my question yeah, but was, still, would you have sacrificed mm -hmm. your pawn on E6 after Knight E7? Absolutely. So, well, it depends on how, like if Black captures and then goes Knight FT7, yes, I would go E6. And then Give away the pawn. pawn. It's worth the weaknesses. Boom. Yep. Boom goes the dynamite. And then the Queen F3 comes in. I mean, look at just, you can visually see the, the amount of threats in the attack. This is just devastating for Black. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, we can get caught up back to, uh, to the game then. And he hasn't pushed e5 yet. Is this a moment where Daryl should go for e5 so that he doesn't have to worry about that threat? Yes, he should definitely play e5 in this very position. Because if you castle, then once again, you expose yourself to this potential for e5. I think Daryl likes to castle first before going e5. Okay, queen a5 is, that's okay. It doesn't accomplish all that much. This queen could end up being very vulnerable uh, to some various tactics involving the knight moving to d5. We'll talk about that a little bit later once Daryl castles. So that's not a terrible move, but it doesn't add too much to the position. e5 is still good here. Uh, we will keep an eye on the way this is going. Let's maybe take a quick look because we have, oh my goodness, look at what uh, Search Head is doing to Awachki here in their first round, uh, first matchup in the winner's bracket. Oh, gosh. Oh my gosh, he is up a queen. Yes. And Black's king is in the center of the board. I mean, this is yet another Botez Gambit today. Knight e4 is very simply. tricky. That's very, an amazing Very, very tricky. Yeah, that's incredible. He's playing so well. I'm starting to think that he might be one of the favorites for the entire thing. Yep. I mean, knight e4, he should have taken the knight, but instead, oh, look at this. Knight slides into the weak square. You win the queen. And the rest is a matter of simple technique as he opens up the center. So, wow. So Sir Chad, and that, of course, would be uh, Sir Ajit Chatterjee, who is... The CPO yeah, of Coinbase, yeah. which is really incredible. Oh, and they're actually one of the main... They are the main sponsor of CryptoCham. So uh, shout yeah. out to Coinbase for making it really easy to purchase cryptocurrency. Indeed. And, uh, well... We remind you that when you sign up uh, and you spend with Coinbase card, you visit Coinbase.com and $5 in Bitcoin for free when you sign up. So, uh, wow, that is a very impressive first game performance here. I completely agree with the Alexander. Uh, he is not someone to sleep on. Absolutely. And I'm not just saying this because Coinbase is the main sponsor. And we were paid to say this because Coinbase is the sponsor. Exactly. Signing out now. No, he's playing incredibly. I mean, even by rating, he should be in the top three. Uh, maybe Daryl is, is higher rated. I think, is there anybody else who's close? Yeah, so Matt Huang, who has just started his game against uh, Leshner, both of them are pretty strong. Uh, Matt, again, his rating is provisional. He's approximately 1,600. We did a couple of lessons uh, before uh, before the tournament. And I can tell you that in terms of his tactical vision, uh, Matt is incredibly sharp. He does a lot of puzzles. His positional understanding is a little bit lacking. But he knows what he's doing in the opening. You can see here he plays the Accelerated Dragon, and he's doing a very good job of it. Absolutely. Um, and Robert Leshner as well, 1,450, very high rated. This is going to be a close game. And it looks like they're just getting started. We have a Sicilian, and it's not the sharpest version for white, but it is still very solid, and it could go either way. Yeah, and both players developing their pieces. We have sort of a Rosolimo. Uh, white generally goes d4 in these lines, but this is a uh, this is a, you know a very tame line. But we got something really interesting for uh, for you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's take a look at all of the players and their setups, and we always love to see video. Wow. This Look at how focused here. they are. Uh, do they know they're on camera right now, though, or are we just kind of lurking, which feels 
a little, a little bit wrong, but it's <laughs> it's not my show. So. You can see there, you know, hands over their head and hands on their head and leaning back and forth. You can just see the focus. They are trying very, very hard here. This isn't just some ca casual coffee house event we're talking about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, no, it's good to be able to see them all. I, I know everyone's taking this seriously. What other fun way to spend your weekend than playing chess? I know a lot of them were in Miami last week for the Bitcoin conference. And this is probably a much more fun weekend experience. Indeed. No, they, uh, wow, this is fascinating. And we got one more matchup. Speaking of fascinating, we got a Tekken who we didn't have a chance to look at in the first round. Tekken Salimi, mm -hmm. we will not make that same mistake here. Uh, playing against Vinny Lingam, who of course won by forfeit. But Vinny, I, I reviewed some of his games before the tournament. Very, very strong player. Uh, he plays the French and he knows what he's doing and he can win a piece here with this move G5 forking the queen and the bishop Alexandra if he finds this move he's going to jump out to an early big advantage in this first game I'm already a fan because he plays the French I hope he finds <laughs> G5 it is a little bit difficult to think about that because you're used to not moving your kingside pawns and, and weakening your king um, but the cool thing is if he plays G5 you might think he that, did. oh, maybe white can play queen g4 and pin the pawn so you don't lose your bishop on h4. But then what you notice is that that bishop on c8 is going to chase the queen out of there as soon as the moment knight from d7 moves. So this is actually winning for black. And to add insult to injury, this queen is literally going to be trapped in this line. It's not even the bishop are winning. We're simply winning the queen. And guess what? Vinny has played g5. The only thing that concerns me slightly is the time situation. Now, what would I do if I were Tekken? you got to drop your queen all the way back. I'm really worried that he might see queen g4 and fall for it. And the idea here is that if Vinny takes the bishop, then at the very least, you can grab um, this pawn on h6 and you get you know a little bit of stuff for the piece. Black's king is weak. The game is far from over here, although black is definitely uh, much, much better. So this is a very nerve-wracking moment for Tekken. Let's see how he reacts uh, to what I'm sure has come as a shock. This move g5, not very common, but such a powerful fork here. And just one thing I'd add here is that even if he does end up losing his bishop, um, his opponent has two minutes less than him, um, and he is two. going to be the one who's attacking. So he still has some chances to come back, because if Vinny's not careful, let's say he moves his knight back from e4, or there's some kind of checkmate threats on h7 with the bishop and the queen, he just needs to be uh, careful, because sometimes you get overconfident when you win a piece. Yeah, but queen g4, I'm sorry to say, has been played. But here's the thing. Vinny has to find knight e to f6. If he moves the knight anywhere else, he might say, well, does it matter? We can move the knight to f8, right? Well, not quite. This does win the piece. But Wait, the queen flies. Wait, stock e1? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't stock mean to... e1? No, 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 no. I didn't mean e1. to cut you off, but that would be a wild result that we should not miss. <laughs> stock guy, yeah? Let me... Yeah, uh, stock guy. Like... And, and this is significant because... He, he did win. played his fourth blitz game yesterday and oh was at around lands. 100 rating when he started, which I'm starting to think now he was smurfing because he's already at 700, which is really impressive. What the heck happened here? Oh, my lands. Oh, I guess this is the second game. Well, this we can take a quick look. No problem. We can uh, we can look at his game um, real fast. And he checkmated. Whoa, look at this mate. Wow. Remember, he was checkmated. Then he won the queen. And okay, the board is not flipped to his view, but just really quickly running through the game here, you can see that he's taking all the white's pieces. Rook f4, rook f2. Some of those pieces were blundered, but ultimately he does deliver the checkmate. Shall we have a listen as he's, I'm pretty sure he's pumped up right now. Let's see how he's doing in a second. All right, so it looks like I lost. Um, what happens from here? Who is he always listening to? He's so I focused. Kevin, but honestly, Oakland? he was no. the biggest underdog in the tournament, and the fact that he got a win is oh, okay. very impressive. So Absolutely. shout out to him Still for taking it seriously and, and playing that well. <laughs> I think the player call our producers are informing us is open mic, so we might be hearing some interference. Well, that's part of the fun, Alexandra. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think they just started their second game, so maybe we could go back to some of the other games we were watching and we can tune back in here. Anthony is going to need to win or he is going to be knocked out. He cannot draw, needs to win. Quick breaking news alert. Believe it or not, Vinny found knight df6 and he won the queen and he's going to win this game most likely against Tekken. That's going to, wow, what a, what a tactical sequence here. As Tekken trying 
struggling down a queen, but you know, two and a half minutes, that might be a little bit of a problem. We'll see how Vinny handles the technical phase of this game. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is going to be really hard to come back. If you were playing from the white side of the pieces, any desperados mm -hmm. you would go for, or it's just a long yeah, shot? Yeah, so let me, sorry, let me find the game again. Mm -hmm. um, and desperados, right. for those of you watching, is basically when you know you're lost, so you play a lot riskier just to try to get any chances, because otherwise you're very likely to lose. So what I would say is that this knight on f5 is the golden piece. You don't want to give this knight away. You certainly don't want to trade. Mm -hmm. I would maybe go knight to e5, which you want to do if your opponent's in time pressure. You want to create the illusion, if you even if you don't have the possibility of creating threats. Small threats, the illusion of activity. Try to worry your opponent into doing something a little bit uh, maybe hasty. And uh, another idea here would be to go h4. You know, just try to, try to undermine the pawn, try to weaken black's king a little bit. Every second that you can take off of black's clock, there is increment. But these players are just not that experienced in bullet. You've got to get black under a minute. Then you've got to start doing everything you can. King f1, I like this move. Just maintaining the status quo, Alexander. I'm worried about Vinny's clock. I like it. I mean, that is the best explanation for trying to win from, uh, you know, the bullet god of dirty tricks himself, Daniel <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank you. So I think we can take a look at uh, some of the other games. Maybe we can check in on how Benjamin and Daryl are doing. Sure. Um, let me pull that game up. And just before we do that, Kane Warwick did go on to win the first game against Eva Base. That's one result we already had. And uh, Sir Chat beat a watch game. Now let's swing on back over to Daryl's game. And this is definitely incredibly competitive as we have a very interesting middle game. White's Queen has made it all the way to H2, Alexandra. Yeah, that Queen is uh, certainly very safe there. Um, both players have some interesting positioning. The queen on h2, the king is on g7 with his pawn on g6 and h6. Um, and there's no immediate threats right now. It looks like there's going to be a big opening in the center. Um, I don't think black wants to take on d4, though, because then he's going to bring white's knights into uh, action. But actually, both players are pretty passive in this situation. Yeah, and he would lose d6. Right. Also, shout out to Grandmaster Hess in the chat. It's so good to see you. He's cheering for Daryl. Um, Dar Hess, uh, such a pleasure to see you always, and we hope you're doing well. Such a toxic streamer, commentator. I don't know anybody who'd be friends with him. He's watching and from vacation. Uh, That's how dedicated so Mr. Hess is. Wow, supporting his boy, Daryl Morey. And uh, yeah, big shout out. I'm so mean to Robert. I, I feel terrible. People who are new to the stream, they you're they just so mean, Daniel. I mean, you're going to have so many haters after the stream. I know, I know. Particularly Hess. I don't know why, why he still keeps coming back to me and commentating <laughs> with me after all that I say about him, you know? Yeah, how you could know? he? How could he? <laughs> Spending his I vacation. Love... Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I, I love what Daryl just did here with, with the move C5. What do you think he's trying to accomplish? He opened up the center, maybe open up his bishop? And that's exactly what he needed to do because his bishop had nowhere to go. His knight on d7 was very passive. Um, he does have a bishop, which means that if the position opens up, he wants it. He wants the bishop to basically be more active and look towards uh, white's king. Yeah, and there was a really cute line that could have happened. Benjamin could have played this very tricky move b4. Now you might look at this and say, Ooh. wait a second, that blunder's a pawn. I'll take and I'll take again. But look at this queen, rook e to b1 literally traps the queen it can't go to d2 can't escape back to the a file because of the rook that was a tricky idea to see though uh instead benjamin releases the tension in the center and if i were daryl i would take on this i would take with a pawn and thing to notice here look at this pawn on d3 that's what's called a backward pawn it's a pawn that's literally behind all of the other pawns and if only white had a pawn on c2 everything would have been safe i like what daryl's doing here and look at the time situation as well under three minutes is Benjamin, he might not be so comfortable uh, with this kind of time pressure situation, still in a very complicated position. Right, and even finding plans here from the white side of the, uh, of the board is very difficult. Maybe he could try something like queen g3 and knight h4, um, because he does have to bring his queen back into play, same with his knight on f3, and maybe put some pressure on the black king. Mm. But Fair if he enough. doesn't see that, um, f4 is actually an, an interesting attempt as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daryl took with a knight here. That's what allowed this to happen. This opens up the center, kind of like you were suggesting, Alexander, trying to open the king side. But to queen c7, such a solid defensive move. This is a very, I'm not being sarcastic. This is a very high quality game. 
Yeah, uh, I, I agree, actually. And this is not a surprise because both players um, are very similar in rating. The time situation is very close. And this is actually their first game. So I don't know who's going to take it. It could go either way. It absolutely could. Rook AC1, another solid move, bringing the Rook into the game. If I were Daryl, I'd probably reposition the Queen closer to the center mm -hmm. uh, just to avoid tricks that, that have to do with this pawn on C5 getting under a pin. So yeah. if this game enters a time scramble, we will definitely be bringing that to you. In the meantime, let's maybe have a quick swing on over to some of the other games. We have and we Foreman. have another result as well. So Anthony Pomp won his second game against mm. Stock Guy. They are the first players to actually tie, which should mean that they're going to a blitz tiebreak, actually, since the score is 1-1. Man, oh, man. Yeah, that's going to be a three-minute blitz tiebreak, and something tells me that game might be decided by the clock. Yeah, that game sounds like it's going to be very chaotic, and I cannot <laughs> yes. wait to watch it. Me neither. That's going to be a lot of fun. And this uh, is we'll such definitely... a nice checkmate with the king in the center of the board. That's why you want to try to castle your king as quickly as possible. You can see that the stock guy didn't develop his bishop or his knight in this situation, which is what ended up leading to his demise. Indeed. That's a nice crisscross mate there. The tiebreak game will begin almost straight away. So we'll be bringing that to you as well. That's going to be absolute chaos. And tiebreak game has begun really quickly um, before this game heats up. It might heat up from the very first moves. We can take a look. We have, um, I was going to find uh, the game between Matt Huang and Robert Leshner. Very I think we're actually game. listening in yeah, on the let's, stock let's guy right now. So um, maybe I'll we can start game. with that and then mm -hmm. we can go back to check out Matt and even do a little post-mortem if needed. Sounds good. Let's listen All right, in. here we go. I'm doing what Alex Botez told me to do. <laughs> no, he, he reversed the order, but that's fine. I appreciate the shout out. <laughs> um, then we'll Lots be in timing. contact with you uh, overnight uh, by email to set up the times for tomorrow. Hey, chat, this is not my fault. Don't look at me. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He's doing great. He's doing great. Look at that. He won a free pawn. If he wins, I'll take credit. If he loses, I'll say it's all him. Just like a good coach, right, Daniel? Oh, absolutely. This is intense stuff. He's actually playing very well. I almost feel like he was trolling me yesterday. Oh, this is professional development. Yeah, uh, and I think we're, we're back to the screen. So what do you think about H4? Anthony keeps playing these kinds of moves. Yeah, well, I, I think it comes from the right place. He has a very aggressive style, aggressive instinct. You know, H4 could act as an anchor for a knight that lands on G5. I think he really likes this idea. So he might be playing knight g5 here. I think that's for a blitz game. That's for d4. That's a dangerous move. The stock guy has to take this pawn. If you don't, white's going to advance the pawn and deliver a fork. One minute has gone down the drain here, but he takes d4. Alex, he takes. who He's... is this guy? Yesterday, he came up with a 100 rating um, out of nowhere. At some point, he told me he's a lost cause and... I should just give him basics because he's only going to remember 10% of the lesson. And he goes in here playing good moves. So I have no idea what's going on. I, I'm actually as, as confused as anyone. And is he going to play Bishop F's? Oh, this is he's extraordinary. What is going on? How is he playing this well? Is he actually playing or did he get his wife to play? Because maybe <laughs> she's the talent in the family. I'm the still lands. impressed that... He tricked someone into marrying him, so. <laughs> but now Bishop B5, and now White is blundered, and he takes immediately. Look at the way this guy is going. What the hell is going on? Okay, can we listen in on his stream? I'm actually confused. Yes, Let's, we, we have to, we need to figure out what's going on, don't we, Alexander? This is insane. How is he playing so well? Okay, so now that gives me time to play counter offense, so I'm gonna put this bad boy here. No. Move, please. Yes, trade -off, chat trade -off, keeps trade -off, saying Stocky no, is, is playing so much better so, today. Yeah, I know, this, this is night and day from yesterday. Solid move attacking the bishop. Will he see? Okay, so if he's going to take, take this, the then we're going to trade off. Okay, so now he's got his rook there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Um, take the bishop. I'm going to go offense. I'm going to go offense. I'm going to go offense. I got to go offense. Yeah, he's finding all the right moves here. 
He's got a minute on the clock. Oh, true. Both have uh, Anthony has a Let's little bit more time. Yeah. So that gives me an I think opportunity he's to win switch by time. pieces around. So what I'm going to do is he's taking a little bit too I'm long. I'm going to. He needs to stop commentating because it's uh, moving it's down. Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and put the queen here. Gotta be much faster. No, let's castle. No, no, no. Let's, let's put the queen here. Protect everybody here. So she can't take him because I got protected. She can't take him because I got protected. Rook Anthony can take that, so but fast. that yeah. leaves... Um, that still leaves me... He's going to flag. To take That's a heartbreaker. This piece here now. Good move again. Okay. This rook is still blocked here. This guy can protect him, but he can't do anything to attack. So he'd have to come down here, which means I could take him. Queen is not in position to take anything except this pawn. That doesn't do anything for him. This rook is still movable here. He's down. 29 seconds. He has to be knights. faster. But look at Pomp. He's down to 45. He's made a move. Yeah, but Pomp is playing okay. very quickly. So that's there. That's there. And okay, he's so not now talking. what I can do is, is I can and go there's ahead no increment and here. put... Yep. Uh, uh -oh. Shit, shit, shit. If I this put is... King in check, yep. he can take that from Yeah, me. 15 seconds. I think he's uh, not realizing the time. I think that's a trade I'm willing to make right now. I, I think he's not even King aware check. He has to get me with the clock. queen. I get to take his queen. The accuracy is probably over 90% of this game, though. He has to hold his setup. I still up have high. Bishop in his territory. I still have uh, Castle available and my Knight sitting back here. We move. His only move is to take is to oh he's gonna he doesn't oh, realize wow. it. Okay, cool. Gonna... All right, so in that That's case, actually really sad because um, he played incredibly. I'm going to move. Um, he's gonna jump out of his chair when he hears the sound. Yeah, it's about to it's happen. Over. Oh god, what do I do? Now? Shit, I wasn't expecting. Wait, how did White win? We Sorry. were tied. That is actually so sad. Why people? That is so sad. He played the best game of his life only to get flagged and. Oh, I ran out of time? Down. Yeah. Um, stock out your face's prices right now. <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know how oh, this man. stuff works. Oh, uh, that was such a bad blunder at the end there. Oh, no. I don't know how I'm any of this works. Okay? Right it's, like, it's like my contracts expiring on the same day as I take them in the stock market, all right? Absolutely valiant effort. You guys are pretty. All right, well, we can come back and, and check out Ooh. some other games. That was a spectacular performance from the stock guy. And Man. congratulations to Anthony because he was very aware of the time situation and it was blitz. So time is part of the gameplay. On that note, maybe we can check out the games that we hadn't seen yet. Is Matt Huang still playing Robert Leshner? Yes, okay. Well, before we do that, Daryl is in a big time time scramble Ooh. against Cowan, but Benj or, or Daryl's probably going to lose this one he's realizing the clock but his his position's terrible he's down in exchange in an end game so this one is probably over yeah count us going ask this in the back now let's come back to the the game between matt i was going to say the stock i must have a pretty good coach i, I don't remember who it is i heard it was some streamer uh some dude. streamer who takes absolutely no credit for the chaos that comes out of stock guy stream for sure i i don't know who, who she is i i've just heard some rumors that's that's all uh, not yeah. to spread any drama but yeah um, no no trauma at all well oh <laughs> that is that is tough i guess he didn't really have a good way to defend his knight other than sacrificing so it is good that he did that at least um robert is getting matt's king out here he does only have a minute and 33 seconds and he is down a full rook so i don't think he's gonna have any tricks here um, I, I think actually Matt is going to go and uh, knock him out and make it to the semifinals. Yeah, he's up a full rook. He's He's got a lot of time, and his tactical vision here is on full display. You know, you've got to watch your king whenever it's on g6. And if I were Leshner, I would go queen e2. You have to keep the queens on the wood. That is literally the only chance. Maybe try to swing the queen at g4. That doesn't even help. Um, but And he's gone queen e2. Now, a very good idea for Matt would be either to go queen to d3 here, swoop in with a queen. You could just tuck your king away on h8. Million things to do here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I mean, the tough thing is that I don't even see any oh. tricks for white here. Oh, he's playing beautifully. I mean, he, he's playing oh, so he well. <gasps> oh, okay. That's... I've never seen so many queen blunders in a tournament as oh we God, have he today. He didn't take it, <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. He's still up a rook. 
Yeah, no, that's true. But have you have you ever seen this many, or or it is a little? I I unique. I mean, I've only seen it, you know, uh, when you know gam certain gambits were played. Um, but I don't remember who originated those gambits. Yeah, yeah I've I have never no really idea. Seen, you know. no, none and at all. Mate. Matt is going to win the second game against Leshner, and he he is into the semifinals. What a convincing match uh, for Matt Huang, um, who is. You know, he's experienced. He's he's very good at tactic, and I can attest to that. He had a terrible. He's not even smiling. That. He looks like he just <laughs> Robert, who just got beat, is smiling more than he did. Um, so that is that is an interesting observation. Yeah, I think he needs there. to. There's that smile. He needs to change his paradigm. Okay, nice. Also, the, good one. Uh, you, you got it right. I got it. I got it. Yeah, that was a good one. That um, is the co-founder of Paradigm. Well, are there any other games still going? So we, we have uh, Tekken versus Vinny, so maybe we can check that one out. Right. And this time, Tekken with a must-win game as Vinny mm -hmm. went on to a very convincing victory. And he is doing a phenomenal job here. White's position is falling apart. The queen is hanging. The queen's protecting the knight. And if the queen drops back down to d2, Ooh. then after takes, takes, that bishop is going to snap up this rook. Black's going to be a full exchange up in the end game. So... Big time trouble here for Vinny. Yeah, and it, maybe we're gonna get another blitz game. Hmm. So Queen Queen D two. Uh, he is trading off kind of the line that we just looked at right now, and the time situation is actually also very very comfortable for Tekken. He has over eight minutes, so it does look like this game is gonna go in his favor. Yes, it does. And uh, what would help is indeed to take the queen here, as he does, and very confident, very very strong play by Tech and he takes the rook immediately. And um, this is basically over if he can just consolidate his advantage and uh, wow, what a what a performance here for for Tekken. We'll keep an eye on this. But the second game between Daryl and Cohen has begun. Daryl now in a must win situation. Yeah. And uh, wow, that is that is actually surprising. Um, but there's just so many players who are very good at chess here that even somebody super experienced and talented like Daryl Morey might be having a, a tough time against some of these opponents. But this is by no means over. Um, even after knight takes c7, queen takes, it is still an even position. However, there is not a lot of juice. There's a not a, a lot of complications here. So I could see this being simplified into a relatively vanilla endgame. Yeah, I mean, if I were Daryl, I would consider a move like queen f3. Keeping this knight on c6 is sort of a thorn in black side. When you've got a strong piece like this, it's very easy to make a blunder, like rook ac8 saying, okay, I'm going to chase this knight away. Whoops, there comes the a pawn. Um, what I, okay, Daryl's taken, and you're absolutely right, Alexander. What worries me is, again, the lack of character in this position. It's definitely not a draw. There's still pieces, uh, but Benjamin is such a solid player. Yeah, he has been playing in, in incredibly. Um, so I guess in terms of what Daryl should be trying to do here, uh, he only has a queen and a bishop that is pointing towards Benjamin's king here. But do you think there's any attacking ideas he can go for? Yeah, I mean, I was considering the move d5 earlier. This is not a good move. It sets a very prosaic trap. If the knight takes, then the queen captures the knight. And because of this pin against black's queen, white wins a piece. The problem is that black can counterfeit this pawn, and this pawn is ultimately going to be lost. So right. I would go with a more tame approach. I would go something like bishop to e3 and try to get black to take on d4. And then this bishop is nicely positioned on the long diagonal. Then maybe a rook lift could come in handy uh, to create some chances against the g pawn. So there's Chan. Daryl has gone d5. I'm, I'm impressed that he found it, but I think Benjamin is going to see the move for a to d8. Yeah, I mean, these are the kinds of moves that you get really excited about and you play because you only calculate the direct mm -hmm. captures instead of intermediate moves like rook d8. Those are the ones that are usually harder to see. Um, but if he does, then he's just going to probably win a pawn. I guess uh, Daryl could play c4 after to defend, um, but then his pawn on d5 is also going to be under attack, so he could just move his queen out of the way, and d takes e6 doesn't work because the pawn is queen, uh, is pinned and the queen Quinned. is <laughs> hanging. Yeah, I mean, there's queens hanging all, all tournament today. Yep, and uh, we have yeah, more pins. Both queens are pinned, so yeah. Now, this is, you know, what Daryl could try here is something like queen to f3. 
Okay, you might say, well, what's the idea? Just he takes d5. Now you can snap this pawn off on h6. We saw Daryl uh, playing a kind of a similar idea in his first round matchup. This is slightly different. The pawn is overloaded. It's doing too many things at once. If you take the bishop, then you lose the knight back. Your king is kind of weak. So position is still full of life. And all of this has happened. Rook 88 and c4. I am very impressed with the way both players are handling this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Benjamin, is he the highest rated in the tournament? I don't think I've seen anybody else over 1650. So he's probably the rating leader. Mm -hmm. And here we go. We see what all four of the last players still standing are, are doing. They all seem very focused. Daryl is, is snacking, uh, which, is, which is nice, you know? He's getting some brain food. He ain't too concerned. He seems pretty calm. Queen to d6, by the way, Alexander, that is an incredibly astute move. Why? Because after queen f3, e takes d5, it turns out that this queen is ideally positioned. You can no longer take this h6 pawn, because after g takes h6, the queen is hooked to the knight. So, wow, I Benjamin is just finding some, some awesome moves here, but I looked at some of his games before the tournament. He's an excellent player, so uh, I definitely think he's, he's going to be the, the tournament favorite here. But don't sleep on Daryl. He'll find something. Maybe I'm not with sleeping on him at too. all. I've been singing <laughs> his praises and, and just grateful for him watching chess for so long. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess maybe we can go back then to the uh, Tekken and Vinny game that we, we last left off here and see if Tekken is able to bring home that win to tie the game and try to qualify for the semifinals. Right. And I mean, I'm surprised that uh, Tekken even had time for this tournament because... Um, he, of course, is the founder of a Tekken startup. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a, <laughs> one of the founding partners of Polychain Capital, which is a, a firm that is doing very well investing in, in blockchain assets. And I'm sure he has his entire calendar booked up, but he made time for this, which is really cool. And that basically goes for everybody playing in the tournament, except for the stock guy. <laughs> and of course, it's, it's not a startup. That was another horrific pun, because I had to say to a tech, tech, Tekken. No, but your puns have been on point today, Danya. Thank you. I mean, it's basically as funny as uh, my favorite movie, My Cousin Vinny. Or shall I say My Cousin Lingham. Uh, really? You made fun of my puns and you dropped that one? You should be ashamed, Daniel. I'm going to take back your GM title just for the lack of pun. Hey, I'm going to take that title. I, it, that's long overdue, Alex. And given the amount of blunders I've made in the last couple of days, um, I've made more blunders than some of these queen blunders we've seen. Mm -hmm. So... Well, so, uh, yeah, oh, I guess, we're, no, no, so we can hop back to this game. I was just going to say, uh, mm -hmm. so Vinny is down an exchange, but, you know, sometimes with being down an exchange, you can still hold a draw. The tricky part, however, is that Tekken just put his rook on the open file. So he's looking towards D2, which would put pressure on the knight as well as the pawn on G2. And if he's able to gobble up those pawns, then the H pawn and F pawn will also end up falling and he could just bring his other rook in. When you have two rooks, because you're up in exchange, usually you want them to be connected and working together. So that's why I like that uh, Vinny just played bishop e3 to mm -hmm. hold down the d2 square. That's absolutely right. And there is some life left in this position. If you play rook c7 trying to attack this knight, that's the first move that occurred to me. Well, I could go whoop, bishop b6, and all of a sudden that's a pin uh, mm -hmm. against the two rooks, or I guess a skewer, and you win back the exchange. Black is still winning, but... Uh, but the game kind of complicates. So mm -hmm. there's some life, and I love the move rook f, rook f to d7, trying to get the rook to d1, forcing the rook trade. When you're up material, trading rooks is a great idea that simplifies the position, makes it easier to win. So it seems like Tekken is very, very comfortable here, uh, convincingly leading, uh, driving in the point. Absolutely. And Vinny is going to get into time pressure soon as well. So any kind of comeback would be incredible. I mean, again, if he could even just hold a draw, he moves on to the semifinals. So if he finds any trick like that, at least he's motivated for it. Try to mitigate it. And as Gary would say, you know, it, it is, you know, incredible, you know, performance here. But I am um, um, taken. So what you could also do wow, is... Wow, I didn't know I was good. streaming with Kasparov Chess. What a treat. No, you know, the owner is all mine, you know, it, 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 it is, you know, it's good, good feeling, you know, to be back, you know, comes in and comes to the currency, you know, but, but in, you know, in this position, you know, rook to d2 check, you know, would have been winning. Rook d2 check actually is crushing. I had to get that one in. And you I know what's love funny? it. I love your impersonations. <laughs> I watched your entire YouTube video where you're impersonating <laughs> different people. And it was so oh, funny. God. It was so funny. If you guys I'm haven't seen it, just YouTube, um, 
Grandmaster Daniel Narodisky, chess impersonations. If you guys I'm know honored. the chess people, it's on point. But let's hope that uh, there's no checkmate here because uh, if, yeah. I mean, yep. King, King G3, there's a mate, and King E3 is mate in one. So there's not a lot of safety in that in that variation. Yeah, Tekken going for Rook C8 uh, and trading Knights. So nothing wrong with that approach either. This other Rook's going to swoop in to C2, and that's going to be game over. Uh, so Vinny running out of resources here. And uh, I'm just selfishly excited for another tiebreak. I love the tie breaks. I mean, the last one was super close. We had uh, Stock Guy versus Pump, and Stock Guy was in a better position, but he totally forgot about his clock and ended up flagging. And 3 0 is very intense. Now they're playing with five second increments. So I think it's actually a difficult adjustment to go from this to being sure that you're not going to lose just on a flag. Yep. And I think you bring up a great point, Alexandra. I saw somebody in the chat earlier say, well, how can some of these players be, you know, so good? at chess, but then, you know, they seem to forget about their clock. Uh, looking at it from the side, it can seem weird because you're looking at the time ticking down. How can they not be making a move? Well, again, it's hard to adjust. When you play a 10 minute game, you're just, your brain has a certain like chess related circadian rhythm. You're like, okay, I have time to think. All of a sudden you subtract seven minutes, no increment. It can be hard just mentally when you're not that experienced to adjust on the fly. Absolutely. Um, and Vinny defending very well here. Uh, rook a2 by Tekens. The only difficulty here is that he cannot move his rook to d2, where he desperately wants to get to control the second rank because the mm -hmm. bishop is doing a fantastic job helping defend. And the more pawns that are traded off, the better it is. Uh, here, oh, yeah, he's going to lose his bishop. It's over. Um, and yeah, Tekens found, found that tactic very well. So we are going to be going to a tie break with this game. Yes, we are. And as this game enters its final stages, we can be sure that Tekken will drive this one home. Let's take a quick look. Um, at, um, well, let's take a quick look actually at what uh, the players are like on the video. Vinny looking very, very confident, even though he's about to lose. Um, so we have their cams on screen. Second looks like he's losing, but he's the one who's winning. He's got his head over his hand. Maybe he's just focused. Well, he is, I mean, both of them honestly seem very, very focused. Yeah. Uh, and Vinny does look a little bit sad, but it might just be his, his serious face. I know I always look angry or something like that when I'm playing. Um, but this game does see, seem over because, oh, there's the mate. There's the mate. He's done it. Well mm -hmm. done by Tekken. And they are going to tiebreaker. And that is going to be fascinating because they're both, they're both good. They played some high-quality chess. So I think they're probably, uh, they probably have played three-minute chess before on chess.com. So something tells me we're in for a really, really fascinating game here. Buckle your seatbelts. I cannot wait. This is going to be super close. It is 1-1. Oh, yeah. uh, they are, you know, very similar rating, about a, a difference by 20 points. Do we know who gets white? Um, I'm, I'm not asking sure. Maybe a question. Producer, yeah. yeah, we're going we're gonna to get the answer to that. Because um, I know for this, it was the highest, higher rated player gets white. And in the past, it's been higher cap score. But we're just going to double check and see how yep. that is. But in the meantime, let's go back to Daryl, Morey, and Benjamin. They are the last game still playing for the semifinal spot. Once again, Daryl is in a need-to-win situation, mm -hmm. um, and he does have a pass pawn. However, sometimes a pass pawn can be a weakness because if Benjamin can get his knight and rook putting pressure on it and bring his king in closer, then he's actually going to end up gobbling the pawn and end up being up an extra pawn. That's right, you can get tempted by this, but as you pointed out, the pawn is a weakness and cannot be defended if it's on a light square. So in such positions, when you've got a passer, and after is an excellent move, paving the way for the king to go. You want to keep the pawn on the square of your bishop until you're ready to move it forward. So I like Daryl's position. I think rook d8 is a little bit too passive. What I would do, if I were Daryl, is go rook to e1 maybe. Okay, the computer doesn't like that move. I guess maybe it allows like knight h5 or something. I don't know what I'm saying. I guess just king f2, bring the king up slowly. Uh, and, and keep the pressure going. I'll tell you what, Daryl's doing a phenomenal job of manufacturing chances against an incredibly strong player. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. he does have half of his opponent's time. Uh, Bishop yep. E5, I think he's not totally sure what to do here because as you mentioned, bringing the king is at least a better attempt. Um, the king is super important in end games. Uh, you can think about it as being valued in between a bishop and a rook. That was something I actually learned from Yasser Sarawan a few years ago that I, I, I didn't know despite playing chess for a really long time. And now I always use it 
as a motivator for uh, telling students to bring their king out in the end game. F4, mm -hmm. nice attempt. In case the knight takes on e5, he's going to bring another pawn to defend on d6. But if f6, then the bishop is not going to be able to protect the pawn on d6 anymore. Yes, Alexander gifts me the pawn. Well, this does remind me that uh, a story in Tilburg when there was a tie breaking game between a Grandmaster Tekken and Grandmaster Vinnie Lincoln, which uh, we are going to watch right now. It is and so wonderful to have you on the stream, Yasser. I'm a really big fan of your commentary and your stories. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. And, uh, we actually just Jenny, have yes. so many different uh, you know, personalities today. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> you never do. And some other grandmaster might pop up pretty soon. But the tie-breaking game is off. Tekken has the white pieces here. And in the early going, Vinny, I feel like Vinny takes a little bit longer in general, but both of them kind of chill in the opening. We've got an exchange French, not much going on so far. Exchange French, honestly, the bane of my existence. I get upset whenever I see these. Why would you want to take the world's most boring opening and make it even more boring? I don't know. Well, maybe white's going to make it a little bit more interesting with castles long, but 94, I like that move. But what we're going to see is probably a trade of bishops, and then you cannot touch this knight. Do not take it because you're going to get forked. Absolutely. Um, and that is what always makes um, exchange friends or any kind of symmetrical positions more interesting when one opponent decides to castle opposite side. Ooh, this is looking a little bit tricky. I like bishop f5 a lot. Um, knight g3 could be the threat here because he would be attacking the knight with nice. tempo and the rook. So uh, Tekken just brings his queen out. He doesn't want to fall for any tactics there. That's an excellent move. Sometimes you just got to retreat. We take have an exchange on c3. I like Vinny's position. White's got a you know, damaged pawn structure on the queen pet. It's not a big deal. Uh, and in addition, he could put his rook on b1 and pressure that pawn on b7 if he wants. What I would do if I were Vinny, quickly develop this knight. I would even put it to d7 and then to b6. What's the idea? The idea is to clamp down on the c4 square so that white can't push the pawn up to c4. Maybe white can go to c4 here. But look at the time, Alexander. He's got half of his time already spent. He's got to start moving faster. Yeah, and he's still in the opening phases of the game. And one thing we always remind people is just make your good moves and make them quickly. You don't have to be a perfectionist, especially when there's no increment, because if you end up having a better position, but you have 20 seconds on the clock, you cannot take your time and win. You're probably going to end up flagging. Whereas Tekken's is playing very quickly. Bishop D3, very straightforward. He's just offering a trade. His Bishop on E2 is not very active. And Vinny plays Bishop G6. So he is giving White the offer to capture the Bishop and he's going to take back with one of his pawns. But usually you don't want to move your kingside pawns. Um, still, he played quickly, so that's some improvement. Yeah, and they're accelerating both of them their pace. I think Tekken is realizing that if he just drags this game out, it, it doesn't blunder anything. Uh, you know, Vinny's now under a minute, but Vinny definitely recognizes that what I would do now is put this knight on the outpost. Black is probably going to put his knight on, on the outpost as well. 95 happens. This also threatens a fork on c6. Vinny taking too long. He's got to play basically three, four seconds to move absolutely maximum. At this, at this rate, he's going to flag in just a couple of moves. Yeah. Um, this is, yeah, he's now down to 35 seconds. Yeah, this is very, very bad. It is difficult. Queen d6, I mean, he saw the fork. He's seeing the tactics. He's very sharp. Um, knight e4 looks like a great move, but he should be playing it almost instantly. And he does. He mm -hmm. plays it in less than two seconds. Very nice he's job. He's doing a good job now, but I'm afraid that the damage has already been done, provided the Tekken doesn't blunt or anything. Perfectly legitimate strategy. He's also got a pretty nice position. This is approximately equal. I would just go F3, chase the knight away with every two seconds that pass off of Black's clock. And ooh, and that's, oh, he wants queen C5. That's a cool idea, but the queen could simply block on D4. Yeah, and I think yeah. he noticed that his, oh, okay, ooh, we knight have knight F2, F2. But... he missed it. But 25 seconds, hey, at least he's going for uh, his best chances here because if he somehow gets a killer attack, that's the only way he can recover mm -hmm. with 20 seconds. And gets, I think Tekken's rushing just a little bit. I wouldn't play that quickly because it's easy to miss some sort of back rank checkmate, particularly in this situation. You don't want to move your queen away. He goes e7, Vinny with 10 seconds. Oh, and queen e6 is checkmate, and he plays it instantly. And Tekken is through. What a And he game. just does his little hair swoop cool. as he checkmates. Yep. He doesn't even smile. Just another day <laughs> in the office um, taking Ws. Vinny seems like a really good sport as well. Yeah. Oh, look at him smiling. That's so wholesome. <laughs> Just a, a, a lot of respect awesome. for both of these players. So 
Tekken will be moving on to the semifinals. And he did have to knock out a very tough opponent, Vinny Langham, to do so. So huge congratulations to him. Wow, that was, uh, that was an excellent matchup. High quality games, this is what we're here to see. But what we're also here to see is Daryl Morey's efforts to uh, perform in a must-win game. And this is going to be very close. They're in a pawn end game, and guess what? This is very close. I don't even know how to evaluate this. This might be winning for white. Right, so what we have is equal material. Black has three versus two on the queen side um, and one versus two on the king side. So what Daryl should be trying to do here is create a pass pawn on the king side by trading off one of his pawns. And then if the black king is distracted and capturing that, he could try to run his king all the way to the other side to gobble up the pawns. And in that case, he would be winning. But there are some nuances, for example, if Black tries to do the same thing and create a pass pawn on the queen side. Indeed, and we got uh, now their videos up on the screen. Daryl Morey, Benjamin Cohen. You can both see their faces now locked in concentration. They're not moving. They're focusing Daryl with a minute on his clock. And I think you did a perfect job explaining what Daryl's approach should be. Now, the computer is showing that this is a draw because maybe Black has some way to uh, slow down the creation of a pass pawn. And in the meantime, Black can try to create a pass pawn of his own. I would even consider the move C4 here for Black, maybe quickly trying to create a pass pawn of his own. And the same thing could happen to White. Black could end up taking both of White's pawns, and this H pawn could end up deciding the game. Mark my words, that might happen. Wow, this is super complicated, even for a very high-level player. This would be very hard, uh, very hard angle to play well. Right, um, and one minute versus three minutes, but this is actually the kind of end game you want to get into if mm -hmm. you're in a must-win situation. Sure, the result might be a draw, but it's not one of those dry draws, say the pawn on G4 was on C3. So I, I, I'm excited to see Daryl try and, and salvage it here, but Benjamin is also just playing incredibly well. King G5 putting pressure on, on G4, but I'd like you to see him here. push his, his queenside pawns. Yep, and Daryl doing a great job. Now, the, the drawback of this is that h4 is going to come with tempo. It's going to come with a check, pushing Black's king away. So, yeah, I think at this point, Benjamin probably has to push his c-pawn. And uh, as you said, Alexandra, I would make an analogy that I think perhaps Daryl would appreciate. You know, when you're playing a slightly stronger opponent, you're basically sticking around until the fourth quarter. You're getting a pawn end game, and in a pawn end game like this, anything could happen. I think Daryl is winning if he continues with king to f4. Wow. And exactly the, the scenario you described, Alexander, is going to unfold. He's going to walk his king over, and at the right moment, he's going to play g4, g5, creating a pass pawn that's going to act as a deterrent, distracting Black's king, which is going to have to remain on the king side. Absolutely, and he can actually already start marching his king to the queen mm -hmm. side because he's never going to be able to lose his pawn on g4 because as soon as the Black king attacks it, he could push it forward to g5, trade for the h pawn, and just be much closer to the queen side pawns. I'm going to be just so impressed with this play if he pulls this off. Oh, this is this is already amazing. The fact that he had the presence of mind to go into a pawn end game, it speaks to um, it speaks to a lot of understanding. He's played a very high quality game. Will he be able to take this all the way home? As he is under a minute, b5 played by Benjamin out. It's very important for Black for Daryl to start walking his king straight away. What you don't want to do, you don't want to go g5. You don't want to rush this move because the problem is that. Black is going to be very quick to take this pawn. I'm a little bit concerned that Daryl might be tempted by this. We'll see. Yeah, that is a tempting side variation. And unfortunately, he doesn't have a lot of time to calculate. Nope. He's getting to close to 30 seconds here. But it's actually great that this is the moment where he decided to pause because yes. this is a situation that can make all of the difference. And here's the thing. There's increments. So if he, if he sets out the right strategy, he'll be able to play quickly. A3 is fine. But Benjamin's going to play saves a5. Him time. It saves him time and lets him think on his opponent's clock, which is not the worst thing in the world. That's exactly right. Well, the problem is that after a5, what you want to be careful about if you're white mm -hmm. is a situation where black liquidates all of the pawns and then yep. himself walks the king over and makes a draw. I'm True. a little bit concerned now that that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I guess it just depends on how, how Benjamin replies here. I like that they're both matching. And Benjamin goes for that variation. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess at B4, he needs to play A4. A4 and just not trade off any pawns, keep them all on the board. And in this situation, he's actually still winning. He is, because eventually that A pawn is going to promote. Once the king takes these pawns and walks around, uh, we're going to get the same scenario. But 
And finding A4 is so difficult. It's so tempting just to simplify and take the pawn, but white is going to run out of queenside pawns in that case. Oh, this is such an educational endgame, actually. So um, this is a good last game to be watching today, although now it's looking like it might not be the last game. We might see a tiebreaker, three minutes between these two. And there comes B4. This is the moment of truth. Right. Will Daryl find it? Oh, no, this oh, loses. C3. No, the black wins. No, black that's so five. painful. Oh, man. Will Benjamin see it, though? He still has but to see has it. To Will see he find C3? C3? Hey, this is a breakthrough. This wins the game. He's thinking he's under a minute. Will he see it? No, he messes it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay, well, now Daryl is winning. Oh, my lands. Now, Daryl just needs to be careful. He needs to take this pawn, walk the king over. And as you said, Alexandra, there is absolutely zero rush with the move G5. He shouldn't play this move until Black is physically attacking the pawn to buy herself more time to walk the king over and take the pawn. Okay, yeah. this still wins, but it makes it a little bit closer. Right. I mean, there, there was no need to do that because now the Black King is going to Darryl. have less time, sorry, more time to grab the pawn and, and try to catch up. And basically, if uh, there's a situation where the White King is on the A file and the Black King is on the C file in opposition, it's going to be a draw. Or if the Black King gets to A8. That's right. So this is a king race. Black's King going... But Black King is a little bit too far away. What Daryl has to do, wasting no time, you have to walk on over, take the pawn immediately. Do yeah, not. Like no, 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 that draws. He's wasted a move. Why did he play G6? Oh, man. Oh, no. This is all about timing. I actually feel like yep, this now it's a draw. transition has just been a class in endgame puzzles. Oh, my land. Sorry, endgame strategy. Yeah. And guess what? Daryl's going to hold his head up very, very high. The man just played a phenomenal game. It's hard to play these end games. It's easy from the side to say, oh, obviously this is what you need to do. But guess what? 15 seconds on the clock. Um, it, it's really hard to figure out the proper approach. So Daryl was within an, just within a millimeter of winning this game. Now it's just a dead draw. Because even if white comes up and wins the pawn, black's king is simply going to land on A8. Yeah, and, and we draw. need to make sure that Benjamin knows the technique. But even if he doesn't, it's an easy one to stumble into because naturally you're trying to go for opposition or get your king to the square where pawns promote. Indeed. And as someone in the chat is saying finesse, that's a great word to describe what is required in these end games. You need a lot of practice. You need a lot of uh, memorization and uh, absolutely no shame to mess this up. If you're Daryl, he came so close. Mm -hmm. And uh, Benjamin is going to go through because it's a two game matchup. And he's going to win one and a half to a half. Wow. Yep. And uh, yeah, he's that's all you need. One and a half to a half this has been the closest match of the day and now it seems like benjamin is going to be the one who is moving on to the championship semifinals and all of these are going to be going on tomorrow so this is our last game of the day indeed it is and we've got the four players of the semifinals provided with the sense and stalemate which it probably will you can literally pre-move yeah yeah oh, and he knows he's answer. not moving his king out of a8 he knows what to do here and so matt huang of Paradigm will be facing uh, Benjamin Cohen uh, in the first semifinal matchup. And in the second semifinal matchup, uh, we have, of course, um, Tekken facing Suroji Chatterjee. And uh, those are going to be absolutely fascinating, very close. But um, of course, Daryl, he's a force to be reckoned with. I'm telling you, I'll tell you what, he gets a little bit stronger in end games, works on his fundamentals. He's going to be a uh, tournament favorite for addition to. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually doing a lesson with Matt Huang later. Nice. Um, so I don't know. Do you think it's unfair to prepare people for specific openings? No, I, I, I am always of the opinion that, you know, this is a serious tournament. I think it's good to promote a serious approach to the game. I think that's what these people do in their jobs and their occupations. They're used to taking it seriously. I think, you know, not looking at traps is good, but opening preparation uh, to some degree, in my opinion, is completely legitimate. And you can tell that some of these players are really booked up. They know what they're doing. Um, as we have a look at the bracket after day one, uh, of course, tomorrow, same time, 10 a.m. Pacific, we will have the finale of this uh, incredible tournament, Crypto Champs, uh, powered by Coinbase. But Alexandra, we are going to take a quick break. And after we return, we are going to have an interview with some of the more fascinating participants in this tournament. Looking forward to it. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen.
Welcome back, everyone. We are joined by two incredible guests who uh, unfortunately made it very far but are not going forward to the semifinals. However, they have a long list of really impressive accomplishments. We have Daryl Morey, a longtime chess fan. He's always hanging out in the chat. Crypto investor, president of the basketball operations for Philadelphia 67ers. I always say that. Number 76ers. Wrong. 76ers, uh, thanks. Like, uh, seven, like 1776. Amazing. And uh, we also have Vinny, who is the CEO of Civic, which is an Ethereum token that makes online verification more secure. And he's also a shark on uh, one of the Shark Tank shows, which is oh. always very brutal and super exciting. You guys played some incredible chess today. Um, you did end up being knocked out, but Daryl, let's start with you. You had a lot of chances in that last game. Did you think you were going to save it in the end? I thought I had it. I, I blame Robert Hess for not training me on end games well enough. It's his fault. <laughs> he was actually <laughs> watching from vacation, by the way. That's how much of a fan he is. <laughs> yeah, he was on Cape Cod heckling me. And uh, no, I knew that was a one end game. And that I, I for some reason, you know, Unfortunately, Endgame is a lot of theory, and I was—I go off instinct because I haven't trained enough. It is what it is. Well, as we were saying before, you were really low on time with 30 seconds. I think if you would have had more time there, uh, you would have figured it out, which is kind of similar to Vinny. In your last game, you had a great position. It seemed like you were going to make it. Did you have a lot of practice with 3-0 before, or were you more focused on Rapid? Yeah, I didn't play any 3-0 games at all the past couple of days. I've been playing 10-minute games the whole time. I didn't know there was a 3-0 time breaker. <laughs> well, so it was news to me. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and was, Daniel, you're tough. like the fastest, best player here. What did you think of his performance? No, it was it was, it was was so close. I thought, uh, Vinny, I thought you created a lot of chances. And one thing that I think our production team failed to mention uh, is, Daryl, I'm a huge Golden State Warriors fan, so I'm sorry if... You know, Ooh. I would have told you that and you wouldn't have gone on the interview. <laughs> we have the better curry now. We have the better curry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, we'll, we'll have to talk about that after the stream. But I, in terms of uh, your speed and your attacking chess, we were very impressed with Alexander uh, as to your attack in the first matchup. Um, King F2, Rook H1. Uh, do you credit Robert Hess uh, for that or is he on your blacklist now? Robert only trains me in end games. I do the attacking. So <laughs> mm, he's like a Russian coach. Coach. Okay. No. 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 I got. I get, Robert's a great attacker. Very, very instinctual player. So, um, but yeah. No. I. I actually. I thought I had really good attacks in every game, but the last one where it ended up being mostly an end game, and I made a couple errors in the middle game when I. I had the pass pawn. I was trying to pound it, but then I, you need to play that so precise. Um, but yeah, I thought my first game against, you know, uh, my second set of matches, it feels like there was some sacrifice there, but I just couldn't see it. Was there one? Cause I had everything lined up at the queen bishop and both rooks lined up. It felt like there was some sack there, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Did you see one the, guys? Was it the first game of your second matchup or do you mean your first matchup? My, for my third game overall, where I had, I had the, um, G file as black with two rooks and I had the bishop and the queen all trained on oh. G2. And it just felt like there had to be some tactical line there, but uh, I, I couldn't find it. Yeah, I don't think we saw anything okay. directly concrete because your your king was was really, really weak. It was sort of in the way. I know. Um, mm -hmm. so I was, Alex, uh, yeah, I he was low on time. So I was just trying to make complicated positions and hope he made a mistake, but he didn't. Or I did, and he didn't. I don't know. Well, at least Robert Hess is going to have more material to cover with you. What about you, Vinny? Did you have any training going into this, or how are you so experienced? Um, so I, I I played a lot of chess as a kid. Um, I I was a state champ in my in South Africa in my you know my old region. I played at the nationals every year for like five years, and so I I played a decent amount of chess as a kid growing up. Not that much afterwards. Uh, one of my one of my close friends is uh, an international master, so I play with him. You know, I used to play with him quite a bit, but not not much these days. So I haven't played a lot of chess in the past, you know, four or five years. But uh, a lot of the stuff is you know instinctual, back in my mind, memory stuff. Uh, it's all coming back to me now. The past week, I've been like playing a couple of games online, and like it's getting back to me. I pride myself on my openings a lot more than my middle game uh, and end game. So I try and get a good start in the in the opening and try and find an opportunity somewhere or try and find a mistake someone makes. 
Um, but yeah, as you know, like you, you forget end game stuff and middle game stuff. So the openings are kind of like etched in my mind from years of like reading all these opening books uh, as a kid. Well, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And it's cool to have opportunities like this that might be similar to the competitions you had when you were growing up. Did you have any flashbacks when you were playing? Did you have that competitive spirit? It's kind of different because when I played uh, back in South Africa, we used to play, like the, the games are like, um, I mean, up to five hours, four and a half hours. It's a very different style of play than the Blitz and Bullet. And I, I've been playing a bit the online stuff a little bit here and there. But it's totally, you know, it's a different time. A lot of the stuff is you have to commit to memory, everything. It's like, it's very much a, a reflex action, whereas uh, you have a lot more time to be contemplative when you're playing the longer form games. It's fun. It's like, a, you know, fast chess is fun, but it's also like <laughs> extremely stressful. <laughs> hmm. Well, I was particularly impressed with your with your French, Finny. I mean, you you played it like a pro. Yeah. Um, and, you know, both of you actually, Daryl, you played the perk. And Daryl, I have one more question for you. I apologize in advance. I'm sure you get this question a lot. I always hear in sports commentaries, chess is often referenced. You know, the coaches have a chess match, all these cliches. Do you feel uh, like there are any kind of similarities in your chess journey um, and your your very easy main job as um, president of operations? Or do you feel like those are over cliched and, and overblown? I think it's generally overblown, but, you know, I mean, like some of the basic principles of, you know, having to, think ahead and stuff but i think there's there's actually pretty good studies that people are really good at chess uh what it means is that they're really good at chess <laughs> it, doesn't, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't it doesn't mean much else hey daryl please don't that. tell people our secret okay that's <laughs> why not did nice. you have to blow our cover Gosh, darn. <laughs> and you were wrong it doesn't mean they're not good at other things it means they're bad at other things i mean <laughs> oh i don't know about there's that. an inverse relationship not just unaffected. <laughs> I don't think that's true, but uh, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people use chess metaphors and, uh, you know, it has one of the best German words of all time, Zugzwang. So, you know, well, there's, there's a lot of good useful terms from chess. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually had a question as well for Vinny because you and Tekken actually chose the same charity to donate to. And it was one of the more interesting ones. It was the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Why did you choose that charity? So, so I have a, a number of people close to me who've had uh, serious uh, mental issues and and you know PTSD type traumas, and uh, they've gone for psychedelic treatments, and it's changed their lives. And I think that there's a lot to be uh, done in that area of research for medical and to figure out um, how to. Yeah, you know, the, the science is good. It was banned in the seventies, you know, because we were an oppressive sort of regime <laughs> globally. And right. I think the research and the work that Maps is doing, the stuff's coming to market. It's it's clinical now. You can go and get ketamine, for example, ketamine treatments, which are for anyone who's had treatment resistant depression. It's probably one of the best things I've ever seen. It's changed people I know overnight from being, you know, suicidal, depressive to just really functioning well. Uh, in society and getting back on their feet. And so the stuff is there, the, 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 the sort of the, the, me the medication is there. We just need to get more research behind it and, and help people understand how to, how to use it in their lives. So uh, I just very supportive of that because mental issues is something which is really overlooked. And, I mean, people you know, stigmatize it and you just need to figure out how to treat it better and people can get back to their normal lives. Yeah, absolutely. I actually lost uh, a family member this year to mental illness. So. Sorry. That is something that is very near and dear to my heart. So I really appreciate you sharing that and having both of you on the interview for today. You guys played incredibly. Indeed. I know that you didn't make it to the semifinals, but you should be proud of how well you both played. Thanks. I actually have a question for you guys. I wasn't watching the stream, but my my uh, in my first game, the, the first game that I won, uh, when I made the, the queen move back to D8 to support the bishop on E7, that was like, I was like, oh man, am I doing the right thing? Yeah, because I was really pulling back the queen. Did you guys, were you guys watching that part of the game? Uh, I'm looking at that right now. It was your first, your first game of your first matchup. Yes. Or your yeah. second, but because your, your first round opponent. Yeah, 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 it was a bye, yeah, exactly. First game oh, that was, I mean, that was actually a very, very solid move. And uh, I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, you're reinforcing your bishop. 
Yeah. Uh, and we were very impressed with the way that you found G5 followed by Knight DF6. It was an only move to trap the queen. So yeah, uh, that was awesome. No, I think it was a perfectly solid move. Yeah, it's, it's, it was like counter instinctual because I'm like, why am I withdrawing my queen back to, you know, to the back rank? And I'm like, I, I think it's probably the best option. <laughs> you uncoiled like a cobra. Yeah, yeah, I think just just that calm and Alexander and Daniel and uh, what a great event and uh, you know congrats to the winners and congrats to all the charities that are going to get uh, some great funds and uh, appreciate you having me very much. Yeah, I echo that. Thanks, guys. This is really great and and thanks for all the efforts and work and behind the scenes coaching as well. Uh, uh, Danny Danny gave me some coaching, so shout out to him. I had a couple of games with him and he helped me out a bit. That was good. Well, that's awesome. Thank you both for being yeah. here, and we'll let you get back to your extremely busy schedule. Thank you, Thanks, Thank you, Daryl. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, uh, on that cool. note, we are just going to take one more look at the championship and consolation bracket. Uh, in the championship bracket tomorrow, we are going to see Surajit versus Tekken. Um, that's Coinbase versus Polychain Capital. Very exciting. Then we're going to see Benjamin Cohen, who runs the very popular YouTube channel, um, and Matt Huang. They're both actually very similar in rating. I think Benjamin is the mm -hmm. highest rated. And then we got the Constellation bracket as well with uh, Kane Warwick versus Meltem and Ben Foreman versus Anthony Pomp. So uh, let's take a quick look at the schedule so people know when to tune in. Indeed. Well, tomorrow the round is going to be in. Tomorrow, Sunday, June 13th, at exactly the same time as today. That would be 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. You certainly do not want to miss the semifinals and the final of the 2021 Crypto Champ powered by Coinbase. And speaking of Coinbase, the main sponsor for the event, we wanted to give a huge shout out to Coinbase for sponsoring the tournament. Make sure uh, you use command XFLAM Crypto in chat and follow the link to get five dollars in bitcoin when you create and verify a new coinbase account it's free to sign up so go start learning and earning cryptocurrency thank you to coinbase this has been an awesome first day of festivities uh, of amazing action alexandra i'm so happy that we got courtside seats any final thoughts before we wrap up day one of crypto champs I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure commentating with you as always. And I want to say for, for people watching, I know we have some people from um, the crypto world and some people from the chess world. If you're someone from the chess world who does want to learn a little bit more, I'm actually launching an educational podcast. It comes out tomorrow. It's me learning from my friend who has been in the industry for the last five years. Uh, he studied computer science at an Ivy League university, worked at top 10 companies. And it's honestly just kind of a starter course for anybody who wants to learn more about Ethereum, uh, not shilling anything, not sponsored just for educational purposes. So I'm going to be launching that tomorrow. I had to give it one more plug because I'm no. super excited. I'm, I'm excited too, Alexander. That's going to be fascinating. And I'm excited on my own part for uh, Blitzcoin, which is going to be a tournament with an entire Bitcoin as prize. That's going to be late October. Mark your calendars for that. But uh, you should definitely mark your calendars for day two of Crypto Chance tomorrow. Alexander, the pleasure is all mine. It's been such a blast commentating with you today. And uh, as we sign off, this has been day one of Crypto Chance brought to you by Coinbase. I'm Grandmaster Daniel Narditsky commentating with uh, WFM Alexandra Botez. It's been a pleasure, Alexandra, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to watching tomorrow's action. Likewise, signing off and chat, stay around because we're going to be rating Daniel, who is going to be playing. So uh, until tomorrow, bye, everyone. Goodbye.